building your networks and, and relaxing. Um, in a change from the printed agenda, I'll be introducing the presenters this morning. I'm Tom Wall. I direct the Watershed Restoration Assessment and Protection Division in the EPA Office of Water in DC. Uh, we're the unit at headquarters that works on water quality monitoring and data management, working with states on their lists of impaired waters and TMDLs, and also we oversee the non-point source program. So I have the pleasure of in introducing our two speakers this morning. Um, our first speaker will be Katrina Kessler, who was appointed commissioner of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in 2021. As commissioner, Katrina is dedicated to collaborative and pragmatic problem solving to address Minnesota's most complicated environmental and climate challenges. Before being appointed commissioner, Katrina held the role of assistant commissioner for water policy and agriculture. Her full career at the MPCA extends more than 15 years. Prior to joining MPCA, Katrina was director of surface water and sewers at the city of Minneapolis where she managed the city's 150-year-old sewer system and worked to meet climate and water quality challenges. Katrina is an avid outdoor enthusiast who enjoys swimming, biking, running, and skiing. And her career also enjoy, uh, includes being a highly effective representative for Minnesota on the Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force. Our second speaker will be Helen Waku, who joined the MPCA Commissioner's Office in 2019 as the Director of Public Engagement and Tribal Liaison. And in 2023, her role transitioned to focus primarily on tribal affairs. Helen joined the agency in 2014 and has served in various roles, including Supervisor for Environmental Data Quality and Supervisor for Environmental Justice and Engagement. Helen is from Jemez in Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. And prior to coming to Minnesota, she worked for seven years as an environmental specialist with Pachanga Band of Brusino Indians in Southern California. Um, one aside, when we reached out to Helen about speaking as a plenary speaker today, she said she would be happy to do so, but how important it was that we have members of tribal communities directly speak to our uh, conference. And I assured her that yes, we did. We were reaching out to Cindy Melda and Eugene Summers to speak, and they spoke in our plenary morning session yesterday and made very powerful presentations. They really helped connect the work we do to the communities we serve. Um, so without further ado, I will turn the podium over to Katrina. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. It's nice to see people I haven't seen in a while and uh, to welcome you to Minnesota. I know you've been here now for two and a half days, but uh, it's it's great that everyone could travel. And um, some of the things I'm gonna talk about, you probably have already heard about in other sessions because I'm I'm focused on work that's ongoing and, and touches much of the work we're doing in partnership with others and is highlighted by the the content. You know, we, we can only do what we are doing successfully when we are collaborating. And that includes collaboration with the 11 federally recognized tribes that share the geography of Minnesota. So excited to be up here with Helen. Uh, as you may know, Minnesota is the headwaters of three international basins. So we have water that flows north, uh, which is um, kind of opposite from the majority of the water in, in Minnesota, flows north into Canada through the Red River. And we have water that flows east out of Lake Superior to the St. Lawrence Seaway and ultimately to the Atlantic Ocean. And then we have are the headwaters of the Mississippi River Basin, which Tom alluded to um, comes with great responsibility as does the other uh, headwaters nature of our state. And I think people in Minnesota really have water as part of their ethos and their identity. A recent survey by the University of Minnesota found that 80% of Minnesotans who were surveyed value water and think about water as a value for future generations. And almost 70% of the survey respondents said it's really important that we don't send pollutants downstream. And I think that's something that you know most people don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that just kind of strikes at the heart of Minnesota's connection to water. And what I like to talk about is that there are 18 million Americans who drink uh, the Mississippi River and most of them don't live in Minnesota. And so we need to make sure that we are doing our part both in state and downstream 
and um, non-point source solution, whether non-point source work, whether that's monitoring or characterizing the monitoring or planning or modeling or implementing, is really at the heart of making sure that we're good partners to our watersheds in state as well as downstream. So couple more uh, grounding facts about Minnesota. You know, we have more than 22,000 lakes and almost 70,000 miles of river. And there are many people here from the MPCA who will be able to tell you like what size lake this is. Because as those of you who work in this area, it's like, well, is it over two acres or five acres? And and what what kind of standards apply in these cases? But regardless, you you can't go very far without encountering water. And um, I think that that's another reason why people have it at top of mind. Again, it's very important that we are uh, collaborating with our tribal partners. And when we talk about innovative approaches, we have a lot to learn and we are learning actively from our tribal partners. So Helen can speak to some of the specifics, but when you talk about the importance of water, you know, the, the importance of water is at the at the origin of the story of, of life for many of these tribal partners. And you probably have heard this. And I think, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, we have to make sure we're making safe drinking water standards. And it's another thing to say, well, this is inherently how we, we see our creation story and how we um, work going forward, protecting multiple generations into the future. And that's important for the state to recognize and for our local partners. And when we come to the table to understand that that is the value that, that our tribal partners bring to it and that we need to respect and understand and work toward that value as well. I also understand that this evening there's an opportunity to go on a field trip. So put a plug in for the We Are Water exhibit, which is a partnership between the University of Minnesota Humanities Service or Humanities Center as well as the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and local partners. This is funded partially by uh, the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment, which I'll talk about. But this is an exhibit that's really focused on storytelling and history and science and the nexus between how people identify with water. And it's a unique way that the MPCA and others are trying to engage people in our work. Because when you talk about non-point source solutions, we don't necessarily have the, lev the regulatory levers. So we really need to be thinking about how, what motivates people? What, what, how are we gonna change behavior or people see themselves in different, in different ways with regards to landscapes? And, and this is one of the tools that we're using. Also, um, Stillwater, which is the current host of the We Are Water, one of 25 cities across the state of Minnesota that has hosted this for um, more than five years now, is a really neat place to visit. So historic town on the St. Croix River, which is a tributary to the Mississippi. So moving into uh, the work that we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I wouldn't, I would be remiss if we didn't really start with the commitment that Minnesotans have made to this work and how non-point source work is really important. And uh, this starts in, in, at least in this presentation, there's lots of history before that. In 2008, when the voters of Minnesota actually went to the ballot and passed a constitutional amendment that dedicated a percentage of sales tax to uh, clean water, arts, parks, and outdoor heritage. So that created uh, dedicated funds of money for uh, 25 years and essentially says that there will be groups of appointed people who will make decisions about how we will spend these dollars and that they need to be supplemental. They can't be money that uses pays for uh, state people who were doing previous work that was required under the Clean Water Act. This has to be above and beyond what we were doing in 2008. And, and this was really a, a, a recognition that that what the status quo was was not working. And the, the, the good thing about this, and I'll highlight some examples, and, and this you'll see this throughout the presentations you hear from people from Minnesota, we've had $1.7 billion appropriated into the Clean Water Fund, which is one of those funds since 2009. And by the end of this fund, which is 2034, unless it's renewed by the voters, we expect that there will have been $3 billion appropriated. And a lot of this money is going to implementation because as you know better than others, that is how we're really going to see the change, which is the key to our non-point source work. So this, this, this slide shows where we were in 2008 versus where we have been able to get since the, uh, or achieve since the passage of the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. And I mean, of 
certainly TMDLs, our total maximum daily loads are not all of what we do, but it is a, a measure that is powerful. I mean, you can't expand wastewater treatment plants if they're discharging to an impaired water and you don't have a plan to address it. And that was really at the crux of what was happening in 2008 is we had communities across the state who needed to expand and we had many, many, many impaired waters and we didn't have a plan in place to address those so that expansion and economic development was stymied. And that was part of the impetus for the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. So since the passage of the amendment, we have really ramped up our ability to put together the total maximum daily loads and um, have have are on track to, to really meet the, the needs, not only of our local governments and our permit holders, but a truly address what is needed on the landscape and do that comprehensively in a way that recognizes that water is not necessarily bound by a municipal boundary, but spans spans across watersheds and across states. So what is that approach that we use? Um, hopefully this has come up in what you've heard yet already, but Minnesota in 2008 was poised to adopt the watershed approach. And this was something that was um, we were hoping would be funded by the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. And then when that passed, we were ready to go. So essentially what this means is that we've organized our work by watersheds and that starts with monitoring. So we're monitoring these 88, eight, Huck, eight major Huck watersheds, and there's other people here can get into the, the nitty gritty of the size of the watersheds, but we're monitoring the chemistry and the biology intensively in each of these watersheds, roughly two out of every 10 years. And then we are assessing that and putting those waters that need to be uh, restored on our impaired waters list. And we are developing plans that address not only impairments, but needs to protect and then we're doing that in a way that not just puts a plan out there and says EPA, here's our here's our bean, please count it, but but in a way that engages local partners and makes this plan a plan for action and putting money behind the actions. <laughs> so we're doing this on um, several scales, and we talked about the international. Uh, headwaters basins, and then we have the Huck 8 watersheds. And we're also looking at small focused scales. So thinking about uh, we need broad landscape changes, but we also have very specific areas that you'll hear about in some of our examples where we just know a culvert or a remeander can make a huge difference in terms of aquatic life. So putting those TMDLs and what we're calling re watershed restoration and protections strategies or wraps together in a way that informs local implementation. Uh, and those of you in this room are very familiar with the clean, uh, the section 319 work. And a lot of this work is being funded by the 319 grants. So this is an effort that grew out of our watershed approach is recognizing that we need to think about locally how we can use input and then drive change at, at small scales that can add up to something big. And I'm gonna move a little bit faster so I can make time for Helen, but, uh, one of the things that is at the core of the work, I mentioned TMDLs, are watershed restoration and protection strategies. So we are looking at watershed wide, where are the impairments, where are the protections? So we put many, many TMDLs together into a RAPS or W-R-A-P-S, and that is what we use in partnership with um, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, who you'll hear from later today, and who lead an effort with local governments who actually develop water plans that call out activities that are prioritized in the wraps in order to get the funding from the Clean Water Fund. So Julie, this afternoon, will be uh, talk or. Julie will be talking at 145 and please go listen to Julie talk about the watershed, one watershed, one plan, because this truly is an innovative approach that Minnesota has adopted that is in partnership with tribes, in partnership with locals, in order to make sure that we are representing their priorities and the scientifically founded actions that are necessary to get change at the local and the downstream scale. And we know that we have a lot to do um, both locally and downstream and here's just a 
example of where we are seeing um, impairments. And this probably looks very similar to those of you who work in other states, but this is a result of those mon intensive monitoring and our work particularly around nutrients. So we know that we have high nitrate, we know that we have eutrophication challenges, we have water quality standards that are exceeded in waters across the state, both lakes and rivers. And that is a challenge for, again, Minnesotans who see themselves as somebody who wants to be able to swim and fish and recreate on the water. It's also a challenge for what we need to be doing for our downstream neighbors. So like the other, uh, like the other 11 states that drain the Mississippi River, we have to do our part around the Gulf of Mexico. And so we have been implementing a nutrient reduction strategy to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus to all of those three international watersheds, but particularly of interest to the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia task force is the, the piece of the Mississippi River. And, and this really builds off the watershed approach. So we have that small scale, we have the eight digit hawk, and then we have what do we need to be doing at a very large scale to see the changes that we need to achieve. And I'll say that Minnesota <clears throat> has done pretty well with regards to phosphorus. We have, again, we've adopted eutrophication standards uh, years ago for lakes and for rivers. And so we have really made reductions for that limiting pollutant in Minnesota waters. Nitrate is more of a confounding challenge, and that really is the heart of what we're all talking about because most of the nitrate in Minnesota comes from agriculture and non-point sources. So how are we using our clean water land in legacy dollars and the wraps and the one watershed, one plan to direct actions on the ground? And we know that we need to have more. So uh, you get you talk about $3 billion, but that's not nearly enough in order to see the, the large scale change that we need to have on, on the landscape in order to uh, achieve the downstream success. So here's one story where I want to just point out we have been able to see success. So this is a watershed near Lake Superior called the Namaji River watershed, and this is a smaller portion of that. This is one of those 319 small watersheds called Skunk Creek. So Namaji was estimated to carry 154,000 tons of sediment to the Duluth Harbor. And as Duluth is a big port and there's lots of things that come in and out of that, that part had to be dredged annually and the cost is extremely expensive. So how can we uh, do more to avoid that and then also protect aquatic life? So in the wraps, uh, there were strategies identified for including um, weir and culvert remo removal, as well as uh, restoration of the um, of the floodplain and the um, riparian area. And as a result, we now have two kinds of trout that have returned to this area. So this is a direct result of monitoring, assessing, developing the TMDLs, putting the wraps together and working with local partners to say, what is necessary on the ground and what are we going to prioritize with those clean water funds? And then just briefly, I want to highlight uh, Minnesota has a, the governor of Minnesota created a climate change sub cabinet. And I am the chair of that with along with 15 other cabinet members. And uh, last year we put together a climate action framework. And why is that relevant here? Well, the climate action framework calls for discrete actions in six areas, one of which is climate smart, natural and working lands. And many of you in the room are very engaged with work that will drive improvements in water quality, but also build resiliency. Thinking about changes in the way we till or manage nutrients or or the crops that we're choosing to grow and when we're choosing to grow those crops and the types of forests and prairies and wetlands and restoration of peatlands that we need to do. All of those things drive not only water quality improvements, but can store carbon and can also increase yields as well as um build resilience. So some of the things that we've prioritized in our climate action framework in the natural and working lands area are protection of drinking water, um, looking at habitat, as well as restoration of peatlands, forest lands, and wetlands, and then just making sure that we're doing that in a way that's cognizant of the agricultural engine of the state of Minnesota. So not dissimilar to what you're going to see called for in wraps. And I think that the the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in combined with what was passed in the governor's budget in Minnesota last year is bringing a lot of money to this work. And I'm excited and optimistic that we will see some real change. And so with that, I'm going to transition to Helen.
Tan mitakiapi, buju, seyamahapae, kaitawahopa. It's good to be here with everybody. Um, really excited to see familiar faces in the crowd too. So I'm uh, lovingly, I, I'm an airhead and water is very new to me still. So I um, just really appreciate everything that I've learned thus far from uh, wonderful experts like you in the room. Um, it is an honor to be serving here uh, in the homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. And I see some of the tribal nations, respective environmental departments here, uh, really appreciate our collaborative work, which is something I wanna make sure that we highlight in this portion of our presentation. Um, the, our agency uh, strives to proactively work with Minnesota tribal nations on our shared priorities on our work to protect human health and the environment. Um, and in recent years, with the passage of Minnesota Statute 1065, which is our government to government um, relations with tribal nations, as well as our agency leadership, really promoting uh, good working partnerships and relationships with tribal nations, we have heard um, that that is being felt and is being recognized by our respect respective tribal environmental partners. I also wholeheartedly will acknowledge that the history of our agency's relationships with tribal nations hasn't always been one of shared partnership, and we acknowledge that, and we are still working on building and strengthening our relationships with tribes. So I wanted to highlight today um, this project that uh, Katrina went into about our, the, our, the watershed approach. Um, this is, uh, you can see the map here of the upper and lower Red Lake watershed. We worked very closely with the Red Lake uh, Tribal Nation. Uh, as you can see, they are a very large part of this watershed. And an interesting fact, Red Lake Nation is one of only two closed reservations in the United States. And um, we've learned a lot from them. Their work that they put into their watershed work and environmental work in general is largely guided by their traditional ecological knowledge. And so we had a lot to learn and the values um, that they bring to this work is something that our teams continue to learn from. Um, pictured here, of course, is uh, you can see the red, those are impaired waters and the un, uh, unimpaired waters are blue. Um, I will say that in the early phases of collaborating, this was all very new, right? Red Lake being a closed reservation, um, it was new for their staff, it was new for our staff. How do we work together, um, you know, sovereign to sovereign on a project like this, especially with a closed reservation? So um, in order to achieve that, a group of experts from the tribe, from the MPCA, from other agencies, Minnesota DNR, and some contractors formed a working group. Um, and together, uh, the work was divided up. Uh, the RAPs and TMDLs were largely uh, driven by Red Lake Nation environmental scientists, and uh, we were able to meet our goal of protecting and restoring waters inside and outside the tribal boundaries. And this work is ongoing, and I did check with the water department at Red Lake, and it is a relationship that um, is going well, and we hope that continues to go well, and we pretty sure it, we are pretty sure it will. <laughs> Um, but in this case, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, it as part of this work, it's important to recognize that sovereignty and manage respectfully our shared resources in this space. Um, and it, I, I don't know how many of you have worked with respective tribal environmental departments within your state, but, you know, it's, it's no different than working with another county, another state, um, another government, you know, coordinating early and often is very important. Building relationships takes time and even just reaching out and asking general questions. Hey, I have a question. Um, what, what kind of work do you do? Or we would like to know how we can collaborate together um, is, is a good first start. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you. And again, uh, strengthening our partnerships is very important to our agency and we strive to do the best we can in this work. And thank you everybody for your time. So I think we have like one or two minutes if anyone has questions for Helen or for me. Oh, and there's a mic. Hi, 
Um, my daughter lives in Bemidji and her, her boyfriend works in Black Duck Chippewa National Forest up there. And I've had the pleasure of visiting on two occasions and the water there looks so very pristine and absolutely gorgeous. And I know that it's the headwaters of the Mississippi right over there and it travels through the entire state. And I was wondering at what point, where within the state does it start to become bad? Because, because it was, it's just, there's problems here. Yeah, so the question is, um, at what point in the Mississippi River's path through Minnesota do we start to see um, problems? <clears throat> and you may have seen aerial photos of where the Mississippi River comes together as the confluence point. Um, I mentioned the We Are Water exhibit is in Stillwater, which is the confluence of or just above the confluence of the St. Croix River and the Mississippi River. We also have the confluence of the Minnesota River and the Mississippi River happening right in the Twin Cities. And um, not surprisingly to this audience, the land use of these tributaries that make a huge difference in where what the Mississippi River looks like at the points these rivers come together. So for the most part, the Mississippi River looks at least aerially, I mean, of course, the chemistry and the biology are the true indicators, um, pretty okay until you get to the confluence with the Minnesota River at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, essentially. And that is a river that has the, a different geology and is just laden with sediment. So you look at this picture and it looks pretty blue until you get to that point and then it's just brown. So, um, and I don't need to tell all of you that that has a lot to do with the agricultural runoff that you have in within the Minnesota River Basin. And that has been a huge challenge for the state of Minnesota and continues to be a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and climate change is really exacerbating that because you see these more dynamic, flashy floods that pr promote additional erosion and runoff. And then you just have additional um, sediment and nutrients that end up in the river. So uh, that's been the focus of a lot of the work around non-point source um, non-point source funding and implementation is within the Minnesota River Basin. <clears throat> I didn't know if you could reshare your, your governor's uh, budget. I'm just curious, how, how does that relate to the $3 billion so, yeah, so this is a good question. I was rushing through this in order to make make time in order to get to the, the interesting red leg story. But I'll say that last budget session, so the budget that was passed in um, July of this year, 2023, the state of Minnesota was fortunate to have a $17 billion surplus uh, going into that legislative session. And the budget that was passed had almost $1 billion earmarked for climate work. And these are all examples of actions that are rooted in our climate action framework that were proposed by different agencies as part of the budget that was passed in 2023 that advanced not only water quality, but as well as um, uh, climate work. And this is above and beyond the $3 billion or the, the money that's ongoing in the Clean Water Fund. So these are general fund dollars, one-time investments to really jumpstart uh, work that was called for in the Climate Action Framework. Hi, morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Epting. I'm with the uh, Nonpoint Source Program, the Tribal pro Program at EPA. Uh, question for Helen. I appreciate your points about um, you know, really needing to engage tribal nations at agency leadership level, as well as within programs. I think that's a, a great point, given that, you know, we're in a room with 51 state programs and 200 plus tribal non-point service programs. Um, there's really, you know, program level coordination that, that we're primed, um, you know, as a national program to really support. Can you um, talk just a little bit about the I think it was the, the state statute 1635. And um, just to clarify, you know, what co tribal consultation means in, in that formal context. Sure. Thank you for the question. So the um it's one slide forward. The, yep. So it's the Minnesota statute 1065. It's in uh was passed in 2022 and it lays out the responsibilities of state agencies, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency being one of them, 
um, to be responsible for consulting with respective tribal nations in the state. And so part of that statute calls out specifically, it defines consultation. You know, consultation is at the leadership to leadership level. So uh, tribal council um, chairs and commissioner, you know, really, if we look at how the state works, you could say that the consultation should be happening with the governor of Minnesota you know, at that leadership level before the specific um, programs, you know, Commissioner Kessler is the one that would speak best to uh, programs related to the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and all of the environmental programs that we oversee versus, you know, the governor. So um, that is delegated authority authority to us. And we also have to create consultation policies. You know, we have to respectfully consult with tribal nations on our respective consultation policy. With that, I will say that our consultation policy has been in draft form for the past two and a half years. And the reason for that is we've been going to each respective tribal nation on our consultation policy and asking for specific feedback on that policy. And so we're in this kind of, I would say, third round and I'm very hopeful that the end of this year, we will have a final, but it's really important for us that we are having those conversations at that level um, in consultation. The paper is very important, but again, building those relationships and making sure we're doing it in a way that is respectful of um, the state sovereignty and uh, tribal sovereignty is really important. So I, I don't know if that answered your question fully. All right. Well, thank you very much again for having us and um, good luck with the rest of your day. What I'd like to do, because what we're doing is having each one do their synopsis first, let's kick off, like I'll make a couple quick introducing the bios, and then do Padmini's video first as part of the synopsis. Still not. Oh, okay. All right. Good morning and welcome to the second part of this morning's plenary. Oh, and I have bios too. So today we're going to be talking about putting the NPS equity memos into practice. And I'd like to welcome, we've got a wonderful team here. 
thank you, mm -hmm. but we're not really going to use it yet. Okay. We'll, okay. We'll be up there for that. Okay. <laughs> Pay no attention to the screen at this point. All right. So we have a great team with us today. So we have Steve Hopkins. Um, is the non-point source coordinator with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, where he manages the Section 319 grants that fund watershed projects and other water quality projects to improve Iowa's lakes, rivers, and streams. Steve has been with Iowa DNR for 23 years and has served as the MPS coordinator for 17 years and has worked with natural resource protection for 39 years. And prior to working in the NPS program, he worked in public drinking water, private water well, and on-site wastewater programs at Iowa DNR. He also operated one of the first dairy farms in Iowa to use prescribed rotational grazing practices. He has a BA in human ecology from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, and an MS in land resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and completed the Iowa Certified Public Management Program at Drake University. Dr. Comito? Comito. Comito. Anthropologist is actively involved in research and extension and outreach activities in the area of water, watershed based community activities, conservation, and environmental attitudes. One focus area is farmers' understanding of water quality issues, soil health, and their willingness to adopt conservation practices on their farms. This includes work listening to farmers in a variety of venues, field days, workshops, listening sessions, and one-on-one -on -one conversations. Another area of focus is youth education. Helping raise youth awareness about water issues locally and globally requires the use of many different approaches, hands-on activities, videos, music, enhanced learning activities, etc. Dr. Camito interacts with a variety of stakeholders, including farmers interested citizens, teachers, youth, environmental groups, and agency personnel. And finally from Iowa also is Steve Conradi, is a basin coordinator from Western Iowa with the Western Department of Natural Resources. Yes, I did read that right, okay. He works to coordinate various watershed project activities for Missouri River subwatersheds in Iowa, as well as some statewide projects, all utilizing grant funds from the US EPA. Steve has been with the DNR in this capacity since 2016, and prior to that worked in fisheries management and achieved a master's degree in fisheries biology from Iowa State University. We also have, um, we're going nonlinear here, JC Brooks from Maryland Department of Environment. Uh, JC is the team lead for the Clean Water Act 319H grant administration team that is in the Watershed Protection, Restoration, and Planning Program at the Maryland Department of Environment. JC has been at MDE for a little over a year and has a background in grant management, environmental education, and stream restoration research. Greg Sandy, who's not with us today, has also contributed quite a bit to these efforts and she might be mentioning some of Greg's work as he goes, or as she goes. From Massachusetts, we have Dr. Padmini Das, who will be with us via, she's on Zoom now, and we'll hear a little video from her. She oversees Mass DEP's Nonpoint Source Management Program as the MPS Section Chief in the Watershed Planning Program. Her responsibilities include the development and implementation of the MPS Management Program Plan through the Clean Water Act Section 604B grant and the 319 Competitive Grant Program. Dr. Das was previously the chair of the Department of Biology at Nazareth College uh, of Rochester, where she also was an associate professor, director of environmental science and sustainability program and director of environmental quality and remediation research group. She has research expertise in soil and water quality monitoring and assessment in the design and implementation of sustainable best managed practices to remediate in a wide array of soil and water contaminants, notably lead, arsenic, plastic, degradants, nutrients, TNT, RDX, PCBs, and emerging contaminants. Through these community-driven environmental projects, she's worked for the benefit of disadvantaged communities, engaging community youth, as an integral part of these projects. Dr. Das has a PhD in environmental management from Montclair State University, two masters of science degrees in environmental science from the University of Texas at San Antonio and the University of Pune, India. 
and Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology from the University of Pune. Dr. Richard Carey, in person, is the director of the Watershed Planning Program at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. He oversees activities to restore, enhance, and protect the Commonwealth water resources under the Clean Water Act. The Watershed Planning Program manages statewide activities pertaining to five programmatic operations, surface water quality standards, surface water quality monitoring, data management, water quality assessment, total maximum daily loads, and non-point source management. Dr. Carey's water resource experience includes leading research projects focused on quantitative data analysis involving anthropogenic influences on aquatic biogeochemistry. He's earned his PhD in interdisciplinary ecology from the University of Florida. All right, so now, what we're going to start off, this is going to be a panel discussion. We have uh, the group, the panelists got together and we talked about the different work. And what we'd like to do is start out and give you all just like the movie trailer version, like a quick five minute synopsis of the work that they're hoping to touch on and share with you today. And um, uh, first, uh, we will have Padmini and we're going to hope technology is our friend. You got it? or you get to click. Hopefully this works. Beautiful. Hi, uh, my name is Padmini Das. I'm the non-point source uh, management section chief at MassDEP. And Dr. Richard Carey is with you uh, today in this panel. Um, and uh, we are really excited to present the Massachusetts Current Justice 40 initiative. But, but before getting to that, I want to start with a common saying in the social justice world that intention does not matter, impact does. I think Justice 40 is a journey from our good intention to make that impact happen. However, until we get that measurable impacts on the ground, all our good intentions and efforts could be summarized to nothing for the communities. So it's a really difficult journey where the results could be all or none. So I, we really appreciate this platform where we are uh, discussing what we are doing and what's working and what's not. So really looking forward to hear from everyone's experience and learn. Um, so for us, we uh, we designed our current initiatives based on the equity memo, and uh, the memo uh, suggested that that states should do projects, um, including preliminary assessment, watershed planning and demonstration projects, capacity building, technical support, and innovative finance partnership to address the forty percent match. And uh, we have done two different kinds of equity assessment. One was internal, uh, and we used the SWOT method as um, strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis. And our goal was to identify what we think are the equity barriers. And we also did external needs assessment survey at regional scale. Uh, Massachusetts has 13 uh, regional planning areas. Um, and in some cases in at watershed scale as well, to understand how they are perceiving the equity barriers and their needs. Um, apart from that, we are also currently considering combining the state EJ and federal DAC criteria. For um, capacity building initiatives, we had a few capacity building efforts were on in, in, in place before the memo came in. For example, we have a watershed-based planning tool. We have been giving outreach and education money for all communities, including EJ communities. Um, but most importantly, we have two NPS coordination program. One is the regional coordination program, and the other one is agricultural NPS coordination program. And based on these two, we designed uh, this uh, EJ Environmental Justice Coordination Program um, uh, that will be uh, part of the upcoming RFP. And the goal of this program is to address the equity barriers and that we identified in the assessment to help the communities overcome those barriers. 
So something we, we are thinking um, long run is that we will uh, probably take a tiered approach um, that will start with community needs assessment, followed by 604B supported watershed based planning and uh, also climate uh, resilient implementation design. Um, Massachusetts have a climate resilient uh, design and standard tool using that tool, um, incorporating that into the planning uh, process. And finally, helping the communities write 319 implementation project proposals and submit on behalf of them. So that's how we are perceiving the capacity building. And uh, last but not the least, of course, the innovative finance partnership to address the match. We have been trying for last one year, you know, and at this point, I think I can, I feel like when Edison said that he knew 2000 ways of not making the light bulb, I, we certainly feel that because we tried so many things and that did not work. Um, but uh, we want to talk about what really gave us the most hope is leveraging the Clean Water SRF program. We never had a partnership with the uh, Clean Water SRF program. And what really helped us that EPA has a guideline about like CWSRF and 319 program. And we used that guideline to establish a partnership with our Clean Water SRF program. And uh, we are in a, maybe it's not a, <laughs> maybe I can say this, that we are at the final stage of uh, you know finalizing that match that we have been looking for so long um so uh to, and again I, i'm still conscious about that all or none <laughs> so but if we get that uh then we will be able to waive the match for the ej communities and uh, reduce it for non-ej communities so all of those they them are still being discussed um so that's a a pretty quick synopsis uh, of the whole uh, initiatives and uh, Richard will talk more about this. Yes, Becca. Okay. Thank you very much, Padmini. And we will have Richard chiming in as Padmini's stunt double later during this panel. So let's hand it over to Iowa and I'll have Steve Hopkins kick us. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Hopkins, Iowa DNR Nonpoint Source Coordinator, representing our 319 program. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is our process in 2023 of updating, embarking upon updating Iowa's Nonpoint Source Management Plan and how that ties into equi equity, which is a primary point of discussion today. Our 319 program, represented by up here by Steve Conrad and I, um, have been working with Iowa State University to put together a preliminary draft of the new non-point source man management plan for the state of Iowa. So the way that we worked it during the year was to very heavily utilize new equity, uh, the new equity memo from EPA that came out a year and a half ago. Um, we tried to be very consistent with a lot of the discussions that took place from the EPA planning guidelines during the year. We in the 319 program provided mostly bullet points uh, for goals, objectives, and action steps. And we contracted with Iowa State to have them do the writing of the plan and to make the plan look good because that's what they do really well. Um, so working with Dr. Jackal and Camito, it was mostly Steve and I in our 319 program providing information to Iowa State University as they developed the preliminary, pre preliminary draft of the non-point service plan. The new plan included four primary water quality goals that were very consistent with the new guidelines from EPA, including reducing nutrients as well as um, improving various types of waters across the state. In addition, to try to be consistent with the equity memo and the discussions about environmental justice, we included a section in the front of the draft non-point source plan with two new emerging topics, environmental justice and climate change. And we had written up quite a bit of information about both topics, referencing other environmental justice and climate change statements that had been written up by USDA, EPA, and other agencies that we work with a lot. And so we were trying to make sure that we were 
being proactive for the next five years of this plan. We put it together, we had a prelim preliminary draft. We also ran the language through um, our, our team, our water quality bureau chief and our DNR attorney, who is our environmental justice attorney. And we're able to move forward until, um, and here's the clincher, we were directed by DNR, Iowa DNR management to remove those two sections from the plan. That was my reaction too. Um, <laughs> stronger than that. Okay. So after catching a breath, after all the work we put into trying to be consistent with those uh, with those words and the references to those two new concepts, we forged a compromise. And the the problem seemed to be the words environmental justice and climate change. And I think there, there was a perception that they would be uh, politically difficult in a new plan at this point in time within the state of Iowa. So we worked on altering the language. And so for environmental justice, we ended up after a lot of conversation using the words underserved. And for climate change, we ended up using the, the words climate resilience instead. We also shortened those two sections a lot. We moved them from the front of the plan to the back of the plan, and we changed the section title to additional considerations. So there, those two parts are in the plan. They're, they just shrank and they're less obvious and they're using different words. However, they're, they're in the pre preliminary draft plan now when we've, we've um, gone through the process of discussing the plan, primarily the four goals of the plan with our, with our partners. Um, however, it really, th this whole discussion is right in line with our conversations about equity, what that means, um, what, what, and our, our uh, assumptions are that words, the words that we use matter a lot. And so we've had a lot of conversations about what those words should be because they will drive our program and our projects for the next five years. Do you want, Do you want to just, mm -hmm. yeah, a couple. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm JC Brooks. I work with Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, I I am relatively new in comparison to these lovely people, but I've been really fortunate to be heavily involved with the projects that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so to just kind of get into it, we have been doing a lot of work on the eastern shore of Maryland fairly recently. Um, we have really kind of uh, targeted a couple different places based on a, a few different factors that I'll talk about later today. Uh, but we're doing some work in the Top Tank River watershed, which um, I'll show you guys a map later. That's what was on the screen earlier today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, two specific projects, um, one of which is directly benefiting a disadvantaged community or a DAC, I might say DAC. Um, and that is installing a few different types of stormwater BMPs. Um, so we were able to bundle together quite a few um, into one project or actually into two different projects. Um, and uh, hopefully that will mitigate some of the flooding issues that they are having. Um, I'll also be talking about our technical assistance circuit rider project that um, is going to be providing technical assistance across the entire Chop Tank River watershed. Um, and we have uh, directed our uh, technical assistant circuit writer to basically target uh, DACs whenever possible. So uh, both of these projects would typically only be eligible for program funding, uh, specifically for the DAC that is actually located in a watershed that does not currently have an EPA accepted watershed based plan, although we're working on it. Um, and so typically it would only be eligible for program funding. And then of course the technical assistant circuit writer position is an outreach position that would usually only be eligible for pro uh, program funding. Um, through the 2022 EJ memo, we were able to uh, 
talk, negotiate with uh, EPA Region 3 and EPA headquarters, um, and we were allowed to use project funding for that, which we were very grateful for. Thank you guys for working with us on that. Um, and we're super excited that that is going to be incorporated into the new draft of, of the guidelines. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about those projects, um, some of the challenges that we faced, um, and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Thank you all. So again, how this worked, you heard a little, the movie trailer. And now as we were talking through one of the beautiful parts about this program is you're going to see how each state has tackled and you're already getting that sense of they're matching the way their programs setting up and taking it on in different ways. So we have these completely impromptu and unscripted questions to lead us through. And if we have time afterwards, think about questions you'd like to ask of them. And if we run out of time, I'm sure they'll be available you know, later at the break. So one of the things during the equity listening sessions, one theme that emerged that was really an unexplored potential to advance equity in the program as a part of the non-point source management program planning process, those five-year plans you heard mention about. What are some insights that you have found effective for your state. So whoever would like to go first. Um, well, we uh, are not currently editing our non-source point management plan at this point. I believe ours goes through 2025. Um, so that is definitely something that we um, will consider in our, our future draft. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys wanna. <laughs> Yeah, we'll come back on another round okay. on the, yeah. So um, I, I think I'm the only not government agency person up here. And because I am that, I can actually be a little more blunt. What did we learn in Iowa? That language matters. I mean, they literally told us we couldn't say climate change and we couldn't say environmental justice. And he, he was a lot calmer in his response than I was. Um. And in fact, in the end, with the underserved populations, they even went as far as to ask us to remove a line where we said we would consult with these populations and listen to what they think they need for their communities. They wanted me to strike that. And that's where I drew my line and then said I wouldn't. So it's still in the plan where we will consult with them. But as a linguistical anthropologist, I want to throw it out to all of you. Does language matter? Why do we keep just giving it up then when people say, oh, don't say environmental justice. So we say, okay, we won't. We'll say underserved populations. That's what the USDA is saying. Don't say climate change. First it was don't say global warming. So we said, okay, we won't say global warming. We'll say climate change. Because then they figured out climate change was just a substitute for global warming. And then they'll say, but it's so political. So don't say that. And I think we just have to really think, when is it going to be worth fighting a battle? about some of these language things. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about water quality. Let's talk about soil health. When is it gonna matter? So I think we have to really start to think, why are they so fierce in their opposition to this language? And then why are people on the other side of the language argument so quick to say, yeah, sure, okay. If it means you'll go along with it, but do they really go along with it? Are we really making the efforts we need to make when it comes to global warming and climate change in the United States? No. So that's just my insight like from a linguistic anthropologist. In the state of Iowa, we compromised. We have something in there, and we figured something was a start. But climate change is happening, as all our college students will tell us. I'll talk about that in a paper later today. And um, I think we've got to really start thinking about, are these battles over language? Because it's more than just the words. It's a battle over the concepts. It's a battle over to what we're going to do about it. So that's just my insight from Iowa. Yeah, thank you very much. And we are and we are gonna revisit a little bit more about words and language a little bit later in the panel too. Yes, uh, from Massachusetts, one thing I just wanna mention is that, you know, the memo, the equity memo that mentioned the internal and external assessments. So you saw Panmini's slides and, you know, one thing we went through was a SWOT analysis and that really helped us to understand the barriers you know, that people are facing. And that's what we're trying to do with our program, trying to implement these various initiatives to address you know, the barriers so that everyone can participate. 
Thank you. So as a follow-up question, this is where I'm making eye contact with JC. Some of the, what we wanted to talk about is, and to your point, Robin, about the existing definition limitations. I think in our discussions as we were preparing for this panel, um, I think the state of Maryland had some pretty specific examples that they wanted to highlight. Yeah, so we we have been really lucky in that um, we have not had issues with wording um, like some of these other states have, although I acknowledge that that definitely um, is a real issue. Um, however, I, uh, one specific issue that I wanted to talk about with you guys um, that's relatively related is the scale of uh, the EJ tools that we um, use every day. <laughs> so Sid, if you wouldn't mind putting up the yeah. first slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is um, a map of Maryland and of the Greater Chop Tank River watershed, which is shaded in dark blue. Um, to the right is going to be kind of a zoomed in portion. And uh, the Greater Chop Tank watershed shaded in blue is a Maryland six digit watershed, which corresponds approximately to a huck, a federal huck eight. Um, if you look at the image to the right, um, you might see a smaller sub watershed uh, that's in darker blue, or at least it's in out outlined in darker blue. I probably should have made it a little bit more obvious, um, but that is going to be the upper Chop Tank River watershed. I'll talk about it a little bit more today um, because the upper Chopper Tank Upper, upper Chop Tank watershed has a, an EPA accepted watershed plan. It's the only sub watershed um, in this watershed that has a plan. Um, and that is at the Maryland eight digit level, um, which corresponds to about the federal Huck 10. Next slide, please. Okay, so the DAC uh, that we have been working with is located at that approximately in that red dot area. Um, so this is a screenshot that I took from Maryland's EJ screening tool. Um, so the way that this works is the lighter colors, so the, the creamy yellow is going to be lower EJ scores, um, the darker that it gets, so into the greens and then into the darker purple, as you can see on the bottom right, um, that is going to be the higher EJ scores, which we're obviously going for. So if you can see, uh, the area that the DAC is actually located in is in kind of a lighter green area. And whenever you actually look at the EJ score um, for that DAC, uh, you get it at 27% approximately. And uh, if you weigh that across all of Maryland, that's only in the 35th uh, percentile. So typically we wouldn't actually think that uh, this DAC would be considered a DAC. Um, and simply it's because at least with the Maryland EJ screening tool, uh, it's on the scale of census tracts. And uh, the DAC that I'm going to be talking about is very small. It's really about 200 people. Um, it's surrounded by larger farms that are owned by wealthier landowners who are most predominantly white. Um, and so a lot of times some of these tools can overlook DACs like the one that I'm going to talk about today. And I actually looked up um, the DAC on the EPA's EJ screen tool last night. Um, according to the EJ tool, uh, it should be, the community should be mostly white at about 88%, which we know is not uh, true. And the selected location does not contain a Justice 40, a CGIST uh, disadvantaged community, or an EPA IRA disadvantaged community. So typically, this community, um, which we actually know to be small, rural, and predominantly African-American community, um, would be completely overlooked if all we did was sit at our desk and you know look at these um, online maps. So uh, the way that we were able to justify that this is a disadvantaged community is um, that in our work plan, we worked with the county um, and use a different tool, uh, which was called the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Justice and Equity Dashboard Tool. Uh, so according to that, our DAC has the second highest CDC Social Vulnerability Index rating. Um, so we're able to put that into our work plan um, and 
provide a little bit more information about the community so that we were able to qualify this um, as a DAC. And uh, we were able to use project funding for that uh, project, which was really great. Uh, so to summarize, I would just say, be careful which tools you use. Make sure that you understand the data that you're actually looking at on the map and how that data is collected. Because ultimately, like we, we can't really truly understand what's going on unless you actually go out in the field, see these people, talk to these people, go to community meetings if possible. Um, so these tools are valuable to a certain extent. I don't want to say that they're all bad, certainly, uh, but just be careful. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Much of the discussion in national calls and 319 guidelines revision work groups focused on barriers related to accessing fund, the 319 grant funds. If you could each touch on how have your programs started to use recent EJ guidance to open up opportunities for EJ communities like JC, like you just touched on. And if you could also kind of touch on what has worked well and maybe what's been more of a challenge or a struggle. So um, I can kind of, you know, follow the Maryland discussion a little bit with how we've started to implement in Iowa. Um, coincident with working on the plan and encountering barriers to what language we use uh, as discussed by DNR leadership, uh, we were also working to apply for grant funding. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico division released uh, $12 million targeting underserved populations as part of their farmer to farmer grant program. And Iowa was able to apply for $3 million of that, that funding. Uh, the original application was keyed into Western Iowa. Uh, Western Iowa is, uh, you know, kind of an older population in the state. Uh, there are some communities there that are majority minority, actually, uh, because of the meatpacking industry that is there. So I leveraged some of those uh, opportunities to apply for that grant. And we were successful in, in receiving $3 million of grant funding. Through working with the EPA partners as well as the other awardees, we were able to open that money up to the whole of the state. Uh, so we we sort of changed the the dynamics of where we were able to uh, spend that money. But we also, as Jackie mentioned earlier, wanted to meet those people where they were at. So we went out and and basically did a solicitation for sub awards uh, to allow our partners to apply for that funding and tell us what their underserved communities were. And so some of the projects are working directly with communities to implement source water protection work. Uh, that's a big part of our efforts to, uh, you know, complete environmental justice uh, initiatives, because we understand that, you know, water customers don't necessarily uh, get to control what is in their drinking water unless they can, you know, apply funding and 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 work on fixing their issues. Um, and so that was an important environmental justice component of that work. Uh, we also had a, one area of the state that identified that women landowners were a key component uh, of their success and ability to, uh, you know, put funding on the ground and accomplish conservation goals in their area. And they were just not coming into the local NRCS offices, the, the soil and water conservation districts that we have in Iowa. So one project is working to uh, build a community with those women landowners and really start to address some of that. So uh, getting that funding on the ground has been hugely important for Iowa to start this conversation alongside, you know, hearing from DNR leadership that we need to maybe soften some of that language. So I think, you know, we didn't necessarily work around them, but we sort of said, all right, we can use the term underserved, you know, this EPA grant, we, it says underserved in the grant. So I'm able to use that term uh, without much complaint from our leadership, uh, which worked out well. Similarly with climate resilience too, we've, we've had longstanding projects to boost flood resiliency in the state. And they're very popular because flooding is a huge deal in Iowa. And so when we say, you know, we're working on climate change, it may be that resiliency building that Steve mentioned as the language we use in our plan. Um, people understand that. People understand weird weather, right? Uh, we just don't necessarily say, or, or at least put it in their face that it's climate change. Uh, we say, you know, 
well, we're just handling those weird weather events that we keep getting more frequently lately. So uh, that's that's how we navigate around that. And on the implementation side, I think we, so far we've been pretty successful at getting money into the right hands and getting some of these interesting projects done. All right, thank you. So in Massachusetts, um, uh, two aspects I want to mention. First is the 40% match challenge. You saw Pat Mina's slide talking about the initiative there. You know, so basically we were running around trying to engage with our various um, state agency colleagues, trying to see where we can get the match. And in coordination with our EPA Region 1 um, colleagues, you know, Mayor Joe Ian, we found out that we could utilize the state revolving fund. And that was a game changer <laughs> because we were, you know, seeking these other opportunities and you had this huge resource that not only could we use for the current cycle, you know, the upcoming you know, cycle as well, but all subsequent cycles just because of the nature, you know, the revolving fund, you know, so just utilizing that resource and thinking about all the opportunities that we can, you know, have you know, engage in our, you know, disadvantaged communities, environmental justice um, populations, you know, to gain access to these funds. Because even if they had the best ideas possible, you know, for their communities, without that match, they couldn't secure the funding. So that was huge, just to kind of explore that possibility. And one other aspect, there's a slide. Um, yeah. Just want to... Give me a second. I'm not sure we have the right ones up here. Uh, okay, so I just want to talk about the EJ coordinators program. So basically, we're going to set up a program that's going to be funded through both okay, our 604B <laughs> grant funding as well as 319. For the 604B, we're going to utilize that for our planning aspects. So regional planning agencies would be eligible. And basically, we're utilizing that funding so that these agencies could be, you know, the li liaison between us and the communities. So uh, develop quality assurance project plan, develop the, um, you know, the, the, the monitoring and assessment, help these communities who may not have the capacity to do so in terms of staffing, in terms of resources, in terms of expertise. And another aspect would be to utilize all the agencies in addition to planning agencies, watershed associations for 319 shovel ready implementation projects. You know, so basically they would apply for the funding and then work with these communities to ensure that not only can they secure the funding, but implement these projects. So those are two ideas we're working on. There's, um, we had a technical glitch, yeah. but we can share the slides that you intended as a part of the post-conference materials. I just want to mention Padmin, as you saw, makes beautiful slides, and yes, I want to show does. that. Yes. And Padmin is at home watching, and I just want to, she's probably there thinking that all I need to do is just not mess up her slides, so I'm trying my best. Padmini, it's on me. One note on match, uh, that was one area we lucked out on with the underserved farmer to farmer grant It's match free. And so we were able to offer that to our sub awardees as well, which really just takes away that barrier. And we've talked about that a little bit, uh, you know, as an overall barrier to participating with the 319 program. I think some of our communities that did apply for that funding, they never would have been able to come up with 40% match or, or whatever match figure we tried to leverage on them. And so it just opened up those doors. Uh, but they did prove that they were able to leverage additional funding. And so a lot of the projects that came forward were almost matched at 40%, even though we didn't require it. Um, so yeah, we're just really proud of our underserved communities for putting together that effort when they know they didn't need to, but they were still able to, you know, at least provide in kind that got us close to uh, what, you know, we see in match for 319 projects. All right. Let's turn to the heart of it all. Let's talk about the people. So one of the themes that we noted as they were sharing their stories that the importance of the people are the ones that make this work happen. And along with those people, it's the words we use and the languages we communicate it in. So we just wanted each of you to share a little bit about those experiences or lessons you might offer to the group. Does the people person want to take this one on? So 
as I was listening to um, everybody else on the panel talk about like the program and how they're working in their states, and I was thinking about the state of Iowa, and when we use the words environmental justice, we're talking about power, right? And power imbalances. We don't like to use the word power either, but that's what we're talking about. So then I was thinking about the state of Iowa and who has the power in the state. The people who own the massive amount of land have the power in the state, and they're also the smallest number of people in the state. So when we talk about EJ in Iowa, almost the whole 319 program is actually going to help those underserved populations by making our lakes, lakes where some of our minority populations can actually use because they tend to be the ones who use those lakes, like Hickory Park near Ames, primarily our Latino population uses that lake. When we think about fishing on our river and actually eating those fish, those are some of our migrant populations. Um, and yet they have the least amount of power in the state, but then so do our small communities and our people in certain of our urban areas have absolutely no power in the state to influence policy and decision making, and yet they bear the biggest brunt of the poor water quality issues in the state. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, and I'm just wondering if other states also have that similar thing, that because these water bodies are a free resource, it tends to be people who need free resources use them and utilize them. And the wealthier people use the fancier lakes and have cabins on them and things like that. So anyway, that's just kind of a an insight in that because let's not make the mistake when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about balancing the scale of power and who has a voice and how do we give them a voice. I just want to add on a little bit there with the the public lakes and who uses them. One of the big areas we've been looking at recently to expand our work with environmental justice has been in uh, the uh, our beach program, our beach resiliency program. So Jason Palmer spoke yesterday uh, to understanding the risk of using a public beach uh, from a pathogen standpoint. So we're looking at that. We we kind of coined a new term in Iowa instead of talking about. Uh, beach bacteria work, we're now talking about beach risk reduction uh, so that the people that use those beaches have a have a safer place to access water uh, and, and recreate in it. And largely, we see on our public beaches, minority populations, those without power that, that Jackie mentioned. And so improving that for them is a, is a key part of our mission as we go forward uh, and has been something that we've talked about using 319 funding for uh, in a lot of our watershed projects. So to kind of jump off of um, what Iowa was saying, um, so talking about, you know, why a lot of these people aren't uh, automatically involved with these projects, um, some of the, the patterns that we're seeing is that a lot of these people, um, you know, are not educated, especially on a lot of the technical language guidance that we deal with right? Um, and so because they aren't educated on this, um, they can't, they don't even know how to get involved, um, which is why we chose to fund our technical assistance circuit writer position uh, to provide direct technical assistance to the residents. Um, because in our disadvantaged community that I was talking about, um, the residents have been incredibly interested uh, in being involved with almost every step the process, which has been really, really neat. Um, but, you know, these are just regular everyday people. They have regular full-time jobs. They volunteer to do these things on the weekend. <laughs> um, and so they don't necessarily have the experience and sometimes the time um, to do this. And so uh, the cool thing about the project is, and, and the county that we've been working with is they have been really helpful in involving the residents wherever um, they can. And now this has caused uh, the project to be a little bit, I guess, slower um, along the timeline, just because we need to take the time to involve everybody, teach them um, language. Um, I mean, these these guys are literally getting involved with the design and build RFP language. Um, they're actually being at all of the meetings. Like they they're being very very involved, um, but. Uh, yeah, it has caused some, um, we, we've been able to build in more time into the timeline to accommodate that, but that is something um, that we've had to consider. And another part of that project, uh, to kind of talk about what um, we've been talking about previously with uh, involving community members, is that we have been able to 
uh, not only involve these community members, but we've also been able to pay them for their time. So like I said, a lot of these people have regular 40 hour a week, full-time jobs and just do this on the weekends and at night. And so sometimes they need to get babysitters and sometimes uh, they need to drive a certain amount of distance, you know? Um, and so we have been really fortunate uh, to pay these people um, because, uh, you know, everybody should be paid for the hard work uh, that they're putting into it. Thank you. All right. So in Massachusetts, um, yeah, in addition to, you know, thinking about, you know, the technical terms when we have these meetings and making sure that, you know, we don't have just a bunch of acronyms on the screen because that can get distracting. Um, you know, two things that we're working on um, for our theme, it's um, active and inclusive uh, community engagement and also meeting the communities where they are. Um, so the first one, you know, we're thinking about the equity memo, the guidelines, and thinking about equity modifiers. Um, so basically thinking about for our upcoming cycle, you know, how can we incentivize, you know, um, grantees to incorporate these elements into their proposals, whether it's um, you know, community youth engagement, citizen science, um, thinking about linguistic isolation, just what are you doing to actively engage all members of the community to implement these projects? And in terms of meeting communities where they are, um, we're thinking about, basically there are many open access tools available in Massachusetts. Uh, you may have seen yesterday on the watershed-based planning tool, and we have additional tools as well. And it's basically depending on the capacity for the particular organization, their technical resources, expertise, they can come in at various levels in the grant cycle process and utilize these various tools to ensure that they can have the best um, project success. success. Thank you. One thing I, I wanted to add about our non-point source plan, our draft plan in Iowa, the document that we have is we're calling a vision document, and it's intentionally meant to be simple, um, easy to read with great graphics. Thank you, Iowa State, for providing that so that and we consider that making it more accessible to Iowans because it's something they actually want to look at and want to read. Um, the old plan had a lot of details, and those were important details, but very few people read it. So the, the new vision document, we're hopeful that people will actually access it. We're still working on a more technical internal document and we'll be working with EPA on that. And I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna add something to that is when we think about the language we use and the accessibility and something that was said in the, key, the plen, uh, plenary speech before about tribal people and their relationship to water and how they talk about water. Um, the way you all talk about water is incredibly technical. It's a resource to manage. Farmers like to call it a resource to manage. But when I did listening sessions with urban and farmers, for farmers, it was always a resource to manage. With the urban people, particularly the younger people, when we started to get on the water as life, water as essential, water as elemental, and water, it's in all of our heritages. We just lost it a long time ago. The tribal people are more in touch with that than we are. But I think it behooves us, and maybe not you, maybe you partner with people in your communities who will talk about water in a different way. That's how you're going to engage people. You're not, they're not going to care about technical terms. And, and, and when you talk about things like that, but they will care when you start to talk about that water is life, that we actually put that water in our bodies and that we are primarily water. And so I think we have to really look at how technical we get, because even I don't understand some of the things you all say. <laughs> you know, I sit there and I kind of gloss over a little bit. So I think we have to think about that if we're trying to get people on board to care and to participate, we got to bring the stakes up a little bit higher than just managing a resource. And it can't even just be for their recreation. It has to be for their spiritual good. It's got to be for their health. And we're talking about the health. We know the studies out there, right? The good social science and psychology studies. Water makes us healthier by sitting next to it, by being near it. And so I think, just think we have to think about language in a whole different way too, beyond just like the words like EJ. What about just even the actual ways we talk about water? Hmm. Oh, that's, yeah. hold on to that. So well said, really, that's a 
perfect segue into as we're closing to the end of this session, if there are any parting thoughts that the panel participants would like to add. And if we'll just see where we wind up if there's a chance for questions. So to kind of go off of what she was saying about like finding people that care, it's really important to, like I said, involve people in the community um, because these people do care, but a lot of times they, you know, have other priorities going on in their lives. So to find those champions, to find those people that um, are really passionate about this is incredibly important um, to the success of whatever you're doing. And uh, we were really fortunate to already to kind of walk in on an existing set of relationships. Um, we have been partnering with a uh, an organization that's called Envision the Chop Tank, which is a collaborative partnership of over 25 different organizations from the federal level down to state, regional, counties, all the way down to local um, community organizations. They had already done the groundwork. They had already developed relationships with people in the community. And so we were really fortunate um, to kind of tag along onto those existing relationships. And so um, what we did was we... We knew that these people had a need and we identified that overlap um, and then were able to figure out, okay, this is where we can actually uh, do some good work that will help these people. Um, but yeah, work with existing relationships um, and tr the trusted messengers within the community because that's really how you're uh, going to be able to uh, be m most effective. Yeah, I would agree with that uh, 100%. We we definitely leveraged existing relationships to build kind of a portfolio of early, uh, you know, environmental justice focused projects. Um, but also like that grant opportunity we got allowed us to be open to maybe non-traditional partners too. Um, the match requirement being waived was huge in that, I think. Uh, and then just, you know, listening and and receiving you know requests for funding from all kinds of different projects and determining you know yeah we can work with that group uh we've never thought about doing that before but it it should work you know that kind of a thing uh just being open-minded to that i think was important for us i wanted to mention one of the projects that we've been working on for a while that i think ties into what jackie was saying and what the rest were saying our data in Iowa has shown that a lot of people don't even know the name of their local creek, much less care about its water quality. So for at least nine years, we've been providing funding to our State Department of Transportation to install creek signs in the state. We also developed a new grant program last year to pay a grant program for counties to apply for funds to put up creek signs, watershed signs, and signs that are uh, the name of the creek as well as the name of the river watershed that that creek is in in part to not only educate them about the, their local creek or watershed but also to help them care so that once they know the name of it they really care about, about their water and we feel that if if they know that if they know the name of it if they care about it 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 helps them connect with that water body and have a sense of place and that speaks to more of the art rather than the science of water quality, but we feel both are important. Wonderful. So there was a technical communication glitch. We actually have more time. So the good news on that is that we have room to take questions from you all. Right over there. Go on over there. Um, this this question a community or a group that was interested and started to put that effort forward our struggle is with the limited resources we have for personnel and those things within the state how do you get to that root group that maybe don't understand even what their own watershed is or their stream because that's the struggle. We, we're trying to figure out how do we, we know where the problems may be. Communities buy in and, and start that process if you don't have that root group to start with. And so um, 
like I said, we uh, were really fortunate in that the relationships were existing, that um, what you're talking about going into a community uh, that does not already have uh, buy-in into it is definitely something that we thought about a lot. Um, because there was these existing relationships uh, that were from partners within the partnership of the Envision the Chop Tank, um, we were not seen as like a government entity coming in to fix all your problems, you know, or because um, a lot of these disadvantaged communities are distrustful of the government, rightfully so. Um, and so we were able to kind of leverage that and just fit in where, uh, where we were able to, which was great. Um, but yeah, we we talk a lot about um, trying to figure out what to do in some of these communities that may not, like, for example, we just like most of you struggle with uh, consent from landowners to do work on their lands. Um, and uh, it's, I really think that it does come down to those existing relationships. And we, um, kind of like what you were saying, we don't have the personnel to always like go into these communities um, and have the time to develop these relationships. Like I can't go, I live on west of Baltimore, so I can't go to the Eastern Shore on, at 8.30 on a Tuesday for a community meeting, but these our partners can and they do and they're very active in the community and they also help with other things um, other than environmental issues like um, I heard that at one of the community meetings um, some of the members were complaining about speeding down the road and immediately right after that meeting uh, the county official called the sheriff's department <laughs> and uh, complained about it and um yeah, so having partners that can stay there in the long term that can show up at 8.30 on a Tuesday, that can do all of those things, because we know that we're limited, um, but having those partnerships have has really been um, essential. Okay. Uh, Hopefully. Uh, Sid. Can we get the screen, please? Yeah. There we go. Oh, do you want to drive this? Is it the uh, it's animated? Yeah. Yes. I'll just load everything. This oh, okay. is and mean is animation. <laughs> um yeah, I just wanted to um show this. This is the EJ coordinators um program that I discussed earlier, you know, pursuant to the equity memo. So basically what we're doing is that we're using the two separate funding, 604B and the 319. So you can see for the 604B, the yellow panel there, we're using that. So basically the regional planning agencies, these would be the eligible entities. They could work with the EJ communities to you know, do the planning aspect, you know, the monitoring, the developing the plans and everything like that, working with the watershed based um, tools. So that would be one aspect where they could um, leverage their expertise, you know, to help these communities. And on the other side, we have the implementation projects. So this is the capacity building as well. So we have more eligible ed entities. We have the planning agencies. We have the watershed associations, environmental support groups. And then basically the um, environmental coordinators would develop you know, these implementation projects to, again, help all these communities who may not have the capacity building, you know, necessary to do that or the expertise. So this is just some of the just some of the ways that we're working with the equity memo to ensure that all, you know, residents throughout our Commonwealth would have access to these funds and can implement these projects. I'll just uh, add that, you know, for some of our work too, you know, we expect reports, right? EPA uh, expects reports, the state expects reports. Uh, Jackie, I may, may need you to cover your ears for this part, but in some of our instances of working with uh, some of our non-traditional partners, we just try to reduce the report burden, honestly, on them. Uh, take a little bit more on at the state where we have the capacity to do that have them check in with us, but not necessarily provide like a formal quarterly report, which sorry, I'm gonna re require that from you, but uh, for, for our non-traditional partners, they get away with, uh, you know, not reporting quite as much. Uh, so so that is one way that we've, uh, you know, worked with those communities that can't, 
we're working with uh, towns that have, you know, a mayor that also is the water operator, but it's probably the wastewater operator too, you know, that they're not going to be able to provide you a quarterly report on time uh, if you demand it. And so, you know, allowing them uh, to work within their existing uh, systems to, to provide us the information we need, and then working with EPA to say, is this good enough? Uh, and luckily, we have pretty good uh, working relationships with our project officers at EPA for that, too. Hi, I'm uh, with the Charles River Watershed Association, and we're based out in Massachusetts. And um, in the past year, our state has established like an EJ Council. And one of the first goals of the EJ Council is to rethink and re and give suggestions to the state on redefining EJ or what categories and threshold um, make um, a block group or a community EJ. I'm wondering for the other two states if that has come up at all, especially to JC's point that there are different thresholds that make up a community. What was the question again? Would you mind? Or yeah, what was the? I missed the very tail end of this sentence. Would you mind just saying the last sentence, please? Yeah, if your states have considered any kind of movement around looking again at what defines an EJ. So for example, in our state, okay. prisons um, don't really kind of aren't well represented um, in Massachusetts. Rural communities are tribal land or community members are um, are not really representative on the EJ scale. Yes. So I would say the question is, have you revisited uh, the definition of EJ in your state and how you're looking at what populations are you working with? OK, sure. Um, yeah, so I am not qualified to <laughs> define um, a disadvantaged community in Maryland. Uh, we call them underserved communities. And I believe I have it written down. The, yeah, so in Maryland, um, the requirements to be an underserved community are you have to have at least 25% of the population be uh, qualify for low income. Uh, at least 50% of the population of those residents um, identify as non-white and at least 15% um, have limited English proficiency. Um, so uh, like I said, I, I'm not involved in the definitions, uh, in the process of developing those definitions. I am really grateful that we are able to be relatively flexible, at least um, with being able to justify why a community is a disadvantaged community. Um, and we we haven't had too many issues with that. We've just provided extra documentation. Like I said, use different tools um, whenever we know and believe that this community is definitely um, a disadvantaged community, but we just can't see it on the tools. So we, we go seek out um, other tools. Thank you. All right, so just want to add for that in Massachusetts, we basically have existing criteria for EJ populations, and we know that with EPA, they have additional criteria for DACs. So basically, what we're going to do in our upcoming cycles is um, potentially use a combination of those, you know, to go forward. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about uh, language issues in Iowa. And and one thing we have leaned on is that underserved, uh, you know, that came with the grant language that we got uh, from EPA, USDA uses it. Uh, so we, we've definitely utilized that to sort of um, look at economic disparities and, and uh, also the SRF disadvantage communities tool that the state SRF program developed. Uh, there's a couple representatives here uh, that is, that was helpful as well. And then we also, you know, took a look at EJ screen and how it could potentially be utilized in Iowa. But a lot of it is massaging that language. So we're not, um, you know, falling off the political tightrope that we all have, have to walk. So add that. I agree entirely. And it really helps when the, the name of the grant is the underserved farmer to farmer grant from EPA. So that is a really logical way for us to to have a, an, a request for applications for a program with exactly the same name. So we're not making anything up that way, but well said. But also just on, when you think about the state of Iowa, we are what, um, not, somewhere around 93% white. Um, we do need to have that dialogue. Who, who are the, if we want to use the word underserved, who are they? 
who 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 really is underserved in the state, who is disadvantaged. And we really have to look at that. And I think we haven't probably had a, a serious conversation because as as many of you know, a lot of people like to think they're middle class, whether they're disadvantaged or not. And so it is a dialogue that we need to be having to figure out how we actually do serve some of those populations who just aren't in the power. So I'm going to use that word power again, who just don't have a voice. I mean, even if they showed up to meetings, the predominant voices in our state are, you know, some of the ag industries, um, farmers, you know, there are a lot of people and they're not, not even all farmers have a strong voice. So there's some different differentiation there. So I think in Iowa, we need to have that conversation, but we need to figure out how to have that conversation because that sounds really easy. But as we all know, it's a political um, mind that we could blow up in. And we, we kind of like our jobs. So, you know, there's balance. Thank you. Other questions? Is this on? Yep. Yes. So, oh, okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Katie Taylor from Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, so we're fortunate that we are encouraged and allowed to use words like climate change and environmental justice, thanks to Commissioner Kessler, who I think had to had to leave. Um, but my question relates to messaging and, and um, respect with some of these words that we're using, right? So you heard about our RAPS reports. We work at a Huck 8 level, um, and these reports are intended to, to summarize all of the information that we have so local planners can use this for implementation. Um, and I think a lot of our, our project managers who work on these are, are struggling with how to message um, an EJ map. How do you put just a map and a report and say, here's where the poor people are, <laughs> you know, like to, to be blunt about it, right? And to be respectful and sensitive to the folks that we want to build up and give more power to. Um, it's kind of the opposite of it. How do we how do we approach this with respect and dignity for folks? Mm -hmm. Uh, that is actually the age old question that people have been trying to ask when it comes because in some ways this is a form of development right and internationally as an anthropologist you know we've we've been good or bad involved in development and how do you go into communities whether it's over uh, in Kenya or it's here in the United States and make sure that you're respecting of people's dignities, their voices. And so, I mean, I don't think there is a great answer to that, but if you are cognizant that you should be sensitive, but then you could go the opposite way and try to be too sensitive. You know, so I, I think just take the lead from the community, ask them how they wanna be defined. You know, and I think you can't go wrong there if you really are just constantly in dialogue and say, okay, you know, we, we show here that you are economically a little disadvantaged with resources and we want to help out, you know, and then just say, but how would you want to talk about this? How do you want to be defined? What do you want to say about your community? So I think, again, that is, these are not just EPA issues and uh, Department of Natural Resources. These are just how do you deal with these issues when you're trying to help communities? Yeah, I have a follow-up question for the Iowa folks. So. Okay. It was, you just said going to the communities and asking them how they want to be defined. Oh. <laughs> that way. Yeah, but as I have a question because the underserved, how do people how, how do people feel about being described as underserved? Because when you say underserved, you can think about it that multiple perspectives. Is that underserved from you know the the state departments not you know providing resources you know adequately to these communities? Is it underserved because they don't have access to these um, opportunities? So how do they feel about the description underserved? So we have definitely had experiences where uh, both the use of disadvantaged and underserved have not been particularly well received by communities uh, applying for grant funding or otherwise. And so, again, we just kind of say, well, define it how you want. Here's how the program defines it you know, understand that you may fit within that, but don't take offense necessarily to the terminology we have to use because of, you know, USDA definition or, or whatever. So um, it, it's been an interesting one to, to walk through because there's certainly communities that have reached out and said, we don't consider ourselves underserved. What does that even really mean? You know, and it's like, well, that's what the grant is named, like Steve mentioned. So, uh, you know, we just sort of say, you know, how, how it fits for you, let us know what terminology you want to use uh, in your reporting. That's fine. Just know that the program and the funding source is going to be named 
underserved farmer to farmer grant or whatever. Um, and it's worked out okay, but certainly, yes, there has been some, uh, uh, you know, sort of questions like disadvantaged community. We don't consider ourselves disadvantaged. So. Thank you. Not easy. I think. So if there's any last comment to that from any of our panelists, um, we are at time, but the panelists will be available. Um, so please enjoy your break. We'll be shifting into two different rooms for the next session. Um, so enjoy your break.
Commission, and I'm really happy to introduce to you uh, our speakers for this session. It's been said that perception drives action and action drives perception. Um, and so we have a great group of talks uh, that really focus on um, public perception of conservation. So um, I'm gonna give really brief uh, bios for these folks. Please look up um, their bios and, and their abstracts to learn a little bit more about them. Um, our first speaker is Elizabeth Ripley. She's a conservation and cover crop outreach specialist with the award-winning Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Program. Our second speaker is Tim Craddock. He's the non-point source program coordinator for the West Virginia Department of Environmental Con Protection. And our third speaker we met in the last session, and that's Dr. Jacqueline Comito. She's an anthropologist um, who's actively involved in research and extension with water in the area of water, watershed community activities, and conservation. And so we'll go to our first speaker. Yeah. Well, hello and welcome. Uh, so a little bit about the Iowa Learning Farms, the program that I'll be discussing our field day outreach with today. We are celebrating 20 years in 2024 and we are entirely a grant funded organization with the mission to improve soil and water quality, building a culture of conservation by working with farmers, landowners, our agency partners, our researchers. Uh, we are based at Iowa State University and how we do this is through a multitude of outreach mechanisms, through infographic publications, through our conservation station fleet, which my colleague Ann Stout talked about yesterday in our Water Rocks program. We're a small but mighty team that covers both of these programs. Um, we do weekly webinars every Wednesday noon central time, although today's has been postponed due to illness. So please uh, check out our active archive of all of those. We do 51 a year um, on a variety of topics. We do virtual field days, which came out of the pandemic um, that we've continued to use for innovative practices. And we host about 30 field days a year. Uh, we are a statewide program service going to all 99 counties. We have about a hundred farmer partners that serve as local resources as well. And I'd like to just give a shout out to our partners. Again, as we celebrate 20 years, this would be made possible through folks at the Iowa Department of Natural Resources with their US EPA Section 319 flow through dollars, our Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, our Iowa NRCS, the Iowa Nutrient Res uh, Research Center, and many, many more. I don't have my cheat sheet. So in the opportunity, oh, Iowa State University Extension Outreach, and uh, I'm, I know I'm forgetting others, but why are we talking about field days? So I've been with the program officially in this role for about 10 years, uh, but we've been doing field days for over 20. And over that time, we've been able to collect a lot of information through robust evaluation of our program, which has helped us continue to be around for 20 years. And so you can um, see this field day success loop. I uh, was published in the Journal of Extension. You can find the citation there in 2017. But what we found is that people that attend field days gain support and knowledge, increases their confidence to adopt a conservation practice, in this case, cover crops. They continue to network with others, increasing their influence in the community, they attend more field days. And so it's this feedback loop and field days really do matter. If we're going to reach our water quality goals, we need to see more of these conservation practices on the ground. And that starts with farmer to farmer communication, which is the heart and soul of our field day planning. So what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is a field day toolkit that has come out of my experiences in planning field days. I have 30 hard copies with me today. It's also a free resource on our website which I'll show the link here in a little bit. But the main thing that it follows through are these three categories. How do you plan a field day? How do you promote it? And most maybe importantly, how do you evaluate it? Because you don't know how successful your field day was. You know, you know how many people showed up, but you don't know how success successful it is unless you evaluate it. So planning. Our focus, and this is based on feedback from attendees, keep it to two hours or less, all right? So even if you have a field component, two hours or less. Our structure is 90 minutes of content, 30 minutes for a free meal. All of our events are free. We have a free meal. That's how one of our mechanisms for getting people to at least step in the door to, to start this conversation. So 90 minutes, that means one or two topics. You're not going to be able to cover every practice at every field day. 
there might be complementary practices like no-till and cover crops in our case are often paired together. Or maybe we're going to focus primarily on perennial vegetation and the conservation reserve program. So pick your topic, keep it focused. We focus them on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Again, this is based on feedback, and I'll show you how we collect that feedback here in just a moment. But that's based on our experience on mass, uh, you know, max attendance and when people say they want to come to these events. So I typically focus our events, while well, our main audience would be grain farmers in Iowa. So our events happen anywhere from January to the first part of April. Then we don't do anything until June because we're not going to interfere with planting season. No one's going to show up. We'll go through mid early September, take a break for harvest, and we actually have field days again starting next week. So that's kind of our schedule for field days in any given year. But all of this starts at least two months ahead of time. So we're going to, you know, amplify farmers' voices. That's our main thing. So we're going to confirm a farmer. We're going to confirm potentially two to three other speakers. I would say no more than three total is a good plan, especially if you're going to do a field component. Any partners that you might have that are going to help spread the word, get people to show up, confirm your location. Is this going to be at their farm? Is this going to be uh, a place where they maybe don't have a heated shop? but we need to make sure we have comfortable spaces for our attendees. So we're gonna be at a community center for part of it. Draft up your agenda, secure your catering and determine any equipment needs. Now, because we do 30 field days a year, we travel with our own tables and chairs. So that's one equipment need that we don't have to procure at each site. Uh, but do you need a PA? Uh, do you have uh, the space and, and appropriate uh, equipment that's gonna be maybe on display if you're talking about a strip till or something and you're gonna have a strip till uh, tool on hand? Here's an example agenda of a field day we did this fall. Again, 90 minutes of program. We started at 1030. Our team showed up in advance to set up our tables and chairs. Wade Dooley was our farmer host. We had a couple of DNR folks uh, talking about perennial vegetation and wildlife habitat. We also have added in a raffle uh, aspect. So we give out prizes, swag with our logo. Um, we hand out Iowa State honey, and then we have lunch. And that's where the networking and social aspect comes into this as well. So that's the planning side of things. Promotion is done in a multiple method way as well. Um, we still stick to traditional press releases sent out to our statewide ag media. We cultivate a local newspaper list. Uh, Iowa has a newspaper directory online, so I can find email addresses for our local newspapers. I send it to our local farm bureaus to include in their spokesmen, uh, local extension offices, and our NRCS soil water conservation districts. So they're our primary target for this promotion. Uh, we also send along a flyer, an eight and a half by 11. They can print out, they can post it in their office, they can post it in their community. We still send mail too, direct mailings. So these postcards are mailed out either to an in-house list that we've compiled from a plat map, thanks to our student hourlies that help us out, or uh, with a partner that may have access to say a federal programs list and people that they wanna make sure get invited. We also utilize our social media platforms to get the word out as well as our robust uh, e-news system as well. In terms of um, how do we know like we're offering a free meal, I do ask for RSVPs uh, to guide that, but that's not our form of uh, registration. So that comes into our evaluation process. Internally, we do a team event evaluation. These are pretty candid, what worked, what didn't. It's also an opportunity for us to capture uh, how many attendees, what questions were asked. Our comment cards are what we use to get people registered. We do mailed follow-up and year-end evaluations. So here's an example of one of our team event evaluations. This is just a Word document that we have printed on hand on a clipboard so that we can record this information in the moment. And then we'll discuss the positives and negatives on the drive home, typed up, submitted. This is great for grant reporting. You can submit this as documentation uh, that the event happened, what went well, what didn't. Uh, so then the registration, we have two separate cards that we have folks fill out. One collects their contact information and how they heard about the event and maybe if they're interested in a specific edge of field practice. The second card is separate. It's not attached. It's totally a separate card. 
that collects demographic information. This allows it to be anonymous because we're asking things like their age, their gender, the size of their operation. And then this is where we ask them, what days of the week do you wanna to come to an event? What time of day do you wanna to come to an event? So if we're looking to engage a younger audience or a female audience or those that have livestock, we can use this information to help guide when we're planning these events. Again, we use follow-up evaluations. So all of our events happening in October or earlier get a two-week mailed evaluation to all attendees within two weeks with the US prepaid envelope, removing that barrier for them to give us feedback. We get about a 40% return rate on those. And then at the end of the year, we send a evaluation to the farmers and landowners that attended to capture any land uh, or conservation changes they've made on their farm in the last year. Again, giving them a prepaid envelope, one page front only. Again, we get about a 40% return rate on that. So just in summary, um, you can find all of our year-end evaluations on our website but this is a snapshot from 2022, putting that field day success loop in action where we can see, have information and, and data to support how important field days are. The more that they attend, the more likely they are to network, the more likely they are to use cover crops. And that also shows how important our, our program is in delivering these and has helped us secure funding for now 20 plus years. Uh, so again, I have hard copies with me, about 30 of them, you're welcome to grab them. Uh, also, you can download it, iowalearningfarms.org, find the resources tab at the top of our website, and you can download it. You can print it, you can make photocopies, utilize it. There's places you can fill in, uh, there's like fill in the blanks. So as you're going and planning it, you can utilize that as well. So there's my contact information. If you have specific questions about planning a field day, you can reach out to me here, uh, our website, and then all of our socials. So you can find us at IA Learning Farms on any of those platforms. So I'll enjoy some questions a little bit later. Thank you. Anytime. Good morning. I'm going to talk about a study we did in West Virginia in fiscal year 21, study of the economic and social impacts of cost share programs associated with agricultural best management practices. Um, basically, you know, I had to educate myself a little bit before we started this because we called it socioeconomics, and I didn't really know what that meant. So I looked up the definition, um, just so, just an FYI, social science that studies the how economic activity affects and is shaped by social processes. And it uh, got me thinking that, you know, social processes, that's people, right? And our programs are all about people, at least they should be. Uh, the team that we put together, this was a little bit of background information. This was brought on by, um, uh, well, there was a task order EPA gives out annually. And sometimes they are specific to agriculture or stormwater or whatever, but we decided to uh, get together and submit something. And the idea, this idea originally came about before the pandemic, we, we give annual project tours. And one of the project tours was in the Second Creek watershed. So we had EPA down there and, and NRCS and a lot of different people touring our 319 projects. And one of the persons that came along with us was a new basin coordinator, Clancy. And she had a background in social science. So we were we were riding back in a van and we were talking about it. All of us were worn out. We all needed a drink or two before we get back to the hotel. But she was mentioning her master's thesis up in, I think it was Massachusetts about social science and how to do these surveys. So this idea was actually generated from that discussion and we kind of kept it on the back burner a little bit and then moved forward. But I do want to give a shout out to the team members. I'm not going to tell you their last name because I'll butcher it most likely. Um, Dennis, he's a conservation specialist 
with the West Virginia Conservation Agency, his activity and work in this was especially critical. And part of this presentation is his presentation as well. Um, he's no longer with Conservation Agency. He actually works for DEP now. He's an environmental inspector. Clancy, I mentioned her. She's, a, she's with DEP. She's no longer a basin coordinator. She works in the Clean Water SRF program. My Myself, um, Dacia or Dacia and Barry Tonin from Tetra Tech. And uh, Patrick, I'll give a shout out to Patrick for our EPA project officer. Critical team members, uh, the team worked really well together and uh, I've been a part of a lot of different project teams that don't always work well together and this one seemed to function pretty well. So I was pretty impressed. If you don't know, this is Second Creek. Um, and yes, West Virginia is a separate state, just in case you didn't know that. Um, this watershed is in the southeastern corner of the state. So it doesn't necessarily share some share waters with Virginia, but some of our watersheds in that area do. Um, a little bit about the Second Creek activities. We've been working in this watershed since 2009. And I don't know if you can see the uh, little chart that well on the bottom. It just shows you how how well we're doing. In, in Kitchen Creek, which is a headwater stream in the, in the watershed, we have over 80 some percent reduction and Second Creek even higher. Now that sounds like a lot and it is a lot, but we still have bacteria spikes and bacteria problems in the watershed. So even with that, le in that level of implementation, we still see um, we need to do more. So this is a little bit more. Here's some look, looks at this Second Creek results. And again, it's impressive. It's impressive the number of reductions that we've uh, achieved. It's impressive the number of BMPs that we've implemented, but it's just not enough. So part of this is, is learning not only that we need to do more, but part of this is learning what the people really think of what we're doing. And that's the, the crutch of this whole survey process. Uh, the cows are pretty impressed with it. I don't know if you <laughs> know that. Here's some survey goals that we had. Determine the economic impact to participating farmers. Determine the economic impact to businesses, which this one's ongoing and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Determine the overall value of the of the environmental benefits. Uh, determine the socioeconomic benefits of non-point source programs, and if these should be factors selecting 319 priority areas. That's an interesting question, and we're kind of still working on that. I think it's important. And determine how the this study can improve agency outreach activities. Um, so our procedure was pretty simple. We worked with Tetra Tech and the project team to develop the survey. It, it, it occurred through basically a year of, of Zoom meetings, video conferences, back and forth emails, and we just drafted the questions. We relied heavily on the, on the expertise of the agricultural community because they know what they're working with. But Tetra Tech was essential in helping us sort of draft a format, develop a, a, a system, of, of questions and, and moving forward, they they were a lot of help. Um, we surveyed participants. Let me try that again. Pers <laughs> no, I'm not going to try that again. We surveyed people that had conservation activities or were involved in conservation programs, like 319, USDA programs, those that received technical assistance. So we didn't survey everybody in the watershed because there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 786 farms in the watershed. So it was only people that we have had some connection with. Uh, we mailed the survey to 122 farmers. Uh, participants, there it is, could respond by US mail or coming into the office. We also had an online tool, but um, broadband in that area is pretty much non-existent. If you drive to that area, there's no phones, there's no cell for a service. So online was a little low. But in order for us to, to, to really do this, initially the uh, co local conservation district sent out a letter sort of introducing the survey. So just a little bit about it, a little one page thing and talked about the survey and what's coming. So it was sort of a pre, we, we sort of used it as a pre-tool 
to prepare these landowners for the survey. Um, and then we hope that helped. We don't really know if it really helped, but we'll talk about return rate a little bit. 43%. Um, I feel like that's pretty good. Uh, mostly that occurred because after we did start receiving surveys, you know, we were keeping track of who we were sending surveys to. So after that, after that, after a couple of weeks of those, we began to reach out individually to farmers. So conservation specialists would make a call or they would go to their farm or that we would encourage them to come to the office and, and just really without being too uh, annoying, we just encouraged them to, to uh, send it to surveys. So we got a, a total of 53 out of 122, which is not too bad. Um, I'm not going to bore you with this too much, but this is kind of, this is a screenshot of one of the pages of the survey. It's not a very good screenshot, and I don't want to go through every single question, but I will tell you a little bit about the survey. It was 10 pages long, um, and that included instructions and comment space, and 29 questions. So, you know, don't know if that was a lot, but I, I felt like it was a lot. I wanted a few less, but... Uh, 29 questions. We also had a couple of pages of demographic questions. So I'm going to talk about some of the results we saw. And uh, we'll kind of work from left to right. It's hard for me to see this. I should have printed this out. Um, so I'm going to slow down a minute. First one, conservation practices on my farm help to reduce soil erosion and runoff. And you'll see that, you know, Keep in mind when you're looking at these pie charts, this is what the farmers think. This is not what we think, this is what they think. So 67% agree that, yeah, that's happening. The next one, um, in my opinion, the conservation practices installed help improve water quality in, in Second Creek. And as you can see, 78% agree, that's pretty good. Uh, the, the other one, after installing BMP, BMPs, I've noticed an increase in wildlife, songbirds, ducks, et cetera. And that was about 50-50. We didn't necessarily see that. Now, when I go down to Second Creek, I see a lot of wildlife. I see raccoons running across the road, poss dead possums, uh, dead deer, geese, things of that nature. So I see a lot of wildlife. So I don't know why, where, <laughs> what the farmers are not seeing. Um, Overall, installing conservation practices has helped improve production and the financial bottom line, which is really what we were getting at. Okay, we wanted, that's what our focus was, and 78% agreed that was the case. A few more, I'm just going to talk about a couple of these. Um, because funding is limited for conservation practices, public agencies should target support programs to areas where water quality concerns are the highest. And everybody, almost everybody agreed that should be the case. Um, there was a couple of situations where people felt like the smallest, smaller farms were, were a little less effective, not getting as much money, but uh, for the most part, we, uh, we felt like that was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, this, um, I actually put this together. This is shows um, an income by sub watershed, whether or not farmers felt like they were having improved income in our farming. Um, and I've chose muted colors, which is not a great idea. <laughs> so you can't really see it. Uh, maybe that's on purpose. I don't know. Um, the gray area is is where nobody saw any increase. But for the most part, most of the watershed did see an increase. I am definitely running out of time. Why conservation programs? This again, this is what the farmers said. Uh, they were concerned about their land and the soil erosion on their land. Uh, the practices were affordable and the conservation practices improved financial bottom line. I'm not gonna have uh, time to go through all these summary results, but what I will say, what's the most important takeaway with all this, when I, when I went into this, I thought that the farmers were more interested in making money. And they were interested in, in, in their bottom line, and that's how many of them make a living. 
but some of them don't make a living. They just are part-time farmers or they farm on the weekend or, or whatever. So overall, this was not about making money. This was about having a better farm and having a better watershed. And that really surprised me. Um, and that's, it was pretty, pretty consistent throughout the whole survey. Those questions were asked. This is, this is what we want. So takeaways, um, the, we need to do more, more work. We need to work with people a little bit better. We need to understand their needs. We need to adapt our, our practices and our priorities to people's needs instead of just a map of impaired waters. I mean, you can always find that if you need to do that to continue get, getting the funding, but ultimately we need to talk about what the people need. And there's a website, and if you want more information, you can get to this website. And finally, uh, if you want specifics from this presentation, like the PDF, if you want an example of what the survey looked like, I'm happy to provide that. We also have a summary flyer, which is a two-page thing, has some good information on it, and a brochure that we are sending out to uh, our conservation partners. So simply email DEP319 at WV gov and and i will get you whatever you want i'm happy to share anything that you think you might be interested in receiving thank you guys all right we're doing great on time but we're still going to hold questions to the end so let's bring up our last speaker Go. All right, so the question that I'm asking at the beginning of the presentation, I'm going to um, suggest that maybe I could have done a better job of asking questions when I did this work. Oops, did I go the wrong way? Oh, okay, that way. So background, you know, I'm an anthropologist, um, but I've also done this work for 18 years. And I do, I, I help with the Iowa Learning Farms as well as the Water Rocks program. And I also have a theater background. So all of that is comes into play when I do this work. We have a lot of stresses in our system. I'm not telling anybody in this room what you don't already know. We had a derecho in the state of Iowa that makes a list of billions of dollars of disasters, not just in Iowa, but throughout the Midwest. We have bacteria and toxins that are found in some of our lakes and on our beaches. You know, we had that hurricane go through Florida. The system is really stressed. And so are the people because the system is so stressed. Here's a quote from an Iowa State student. He talks about how he grew up in a small town. And he can remember having school announcements where the speaker would say, hey, you can't get a drink out of the water fountain today because we just did a water test. In other words, the water was no good, so kids don't drink it. Eco-anxiety is now a very real thing that the American Psychological Association has put on their, uh, on their uh, diseases that they treat. And it's, it is. And when you talk to especially younger people, they are feeling this acutely. Here's one, a student at University of Northern Iowa in Iowa. She said she's not going to have children because she thinks that's the most sustainable thing to do. And we hear that increasingly more from our young people. So I would say that right now we're in a crisis of both spirit and culture. Here's a male student from University of Iowa. Climate change, it exists. He's not particularly happy about it. It's a source of worry. I'm not gonna read all these quotes because you can actually find the complete report on um, our Conservation Learning Group website. And then you can actually take more time to read these quotes. Gus Beth, who's a pretty famous environmentalist, worked for the Natural Resources Divest Council co-founder. He wrote this poem in 2020 where he actually says that we need a spiritual awakening. So he's actually saying, okay, scientists, let's also bring on the preachers, the prophets, the poets, the philosophers, the psychologists, the psychiatrists. Let's bring on the writers, the musicians, the actors, the artists, and call them to strike the chords of our shared humanity, of our close kin to wild things. He wrote this poem because he realized that he couldn't just get there on the science alone. So how are we gonna do this? Before I get to talk about how we're gonna do it, I'm gonna share a little bit more on the college students' perspectives on water issues in Iowa. 
So we did a survey, our college students in the state, and we focus on our three regent universities, have never really been surveyed about their opinion of water quality, so we thought we'd give it a try. There are there were approximately at this time 51,000, almost 52,000 individuals we surveyed, and we got 2,281 back. It's only a 6.5% response rate, but if you think about who it is we're asking and how many we have, that's actually a fairly decent response rate. We also went onto the campuses, set up a camera, and conducted interviews with 20 students on each one of the campuses. So one of the things we noticed when we looked at the data, that pro the proximity of the local river on campus seemed to influence the answers that the students gave us. So University of Iowa is right there on the river. It runs right through it, it floods often, et cetera, et cetera. UNI is about 2.5 miles from campus, the river, Cedar, uh, the Cedar Rivers. And then ISU has about, uh, the Skunk River is about four miles from campus. So when we think of drinking water, Iowa State students were most likely to say drinking water is safe and the University of Iowa students were the least likely to say their drinking water was safe, but none of them, there were still students that thought the drinking water wasn't safe. Here's a quote. I'm aware that some of the faucets here in Iowa, I guess, tend to have a brown tint to it. So in Iowa, it was really about the smell of the water, the look of the water. And then in Ames, female student. My dad says Ames water is the best water. And actually, that is a, that's mythology in Iowa, right? University of Iowa, Iowa City, horrible water. Ames, great water. Surface water. The Iowa State students were least likely to say that surface water quality is poor. And the University of Iowa were the most likely to say the surface water was poor. And the UNI fell in between. Here's from the University of Iowa. Oh, yes. There's a huge problem. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we've got agriculture runoff, so fertilizers and water. I mean, the Iowa River is disgusting. I would never swim in it. You'd probably get cancer. Male student from Iowa State. I don't know. I guess I haven't heard about a water problem. So I guess I'm going to say no. And then the UNI, and I love this quote, so I actually am going to read it, fell in between. I just feel like obviously it's going to be better quality than some places, but everywhere you go, there's going to be an occasional spot where the water quality isn't as good as it can be. And even if it's considered decent, I feel like there's always room for improvement in certain areas, maybe not in certain cities such as Cedar Falls, but in smaller cities. And anyway, it went on. That was kind of the difference in the responses between Iowa State, UNI, and Iowa. So I wondered to myself when I started exploring these issues a little bit more. What might the students have said to me if I'd actually just asked them this question? If I didn't ask them about water quality, if I actually said, hey, what would a healthy river look like? I love Tony Morrison, and I, I saw this quote, and I said, yeah, this is exactly right, because if you're going to get creative, you have to ask yourself the right questions. Like, what does the ideal room look like? Is there music? Is there silence? Is there chaos outside? Or is there serenity outside? What do I need to do in order to release my imagination? New scholarship on imagination, and maybe this will just geek out for me, and you won't be, but as an anthropologist, this is really provocative, that imagination, not language, is what makes us human. It makes humans human. At first, it was tool making made us human, but then Jane Goodall discovered that chimps make tools and use them. So then, oh, wait, we're not the tool maker, so homo habula, sorry, we're not that. So then it became language. Language is what makes us human. But now this guy is saying it's the imagination that makes us human. So he's suggesting that imagination properly understood is one of the earliest human abilities, not a recent arrival. Thinking and communicating are vastly improved by language, it is true, but thinking with imagery and even thinking with the body must have preceded language by hundreds of thousands of years. It's actually something we share with our mammal friends. Thinking in images and thinking with the body. In other words, we are people who live in a world and a lot of what we understand by the world is embodied. And our imaginations actually play before we even formed a language, we were experiencing the world in this way. So it's a very provocative argument. And then he adds, Flying by the seat of our pants is not just some analogy to pre-linguistic communication. It is 
communication. So in other words, part of also what makes us human is the ability to fly by the seat of our pants and solve problems. Who in the room doesn't get excited when suddenly you're confronted with something, at first you panic, but then your brain goes to work and you solve that problem in that moment. Raise your hand. Exciting? It exhilarates you? You might even feel a little bit more alive when it happens. You might be scared when it first happens, but then your humanness kicks in. I always like to go to the dictionary to see the origin of words. And imagination comes from the Latin, to picture oneself. And then I looked up improvisation too, because it's part of his theory. And improvisation is literally from the Latin to mean unforeseen. So part of our imagination is to picture yourself in unforeseen circumstances. And then think about something different or think of how it could be different. So imagination drives everything. Everything we do, it's driven by our imagination. It makes all possible what is, what has been, what might be. It's a mental process that can mediate between what is present and what is absent. It's that state that exists between two things, like that circle. If I'd ask you to turn that circle into something, you might not do what we turn the circle into. Or you might. Some of the people, that might be an association, circle sheep. Even Albert Einstein back in 1929 acknowledged the role that the imagination had in him. He says, I am enough of the artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. If imagination lets us feel at home in the world, it also enables us to get things done in the world. So many of our failures, and I dare say a few of our successes, are in fact failures of the imagination. And then if we think about the eco-anxiety I was telling you about, it is through our imaginations that we can actually help alleviate that. Thinking about solutions. So when we work, you, you heard some of you heard the program on water rocks. One of the things we don't do is scare them. Instead, we try to empower them. We try to engage their imaginations and help them. We're actually with them, the younger kids, I am actually helping them picture what a healthy river in Iowa might look like. Back in 1996, Lawrence Buell actually came out and said that this environmental crisis is a crisis of the imagination. It's a crisis of the imagination. Because quite frankly, part of what the imagination does is embodied. And so for college age students in Iowa, and we actually, um, we only kept the surveys from the students who had lived in Iowa for a certain length of time. So most of these students in our survey are students that were born, you're not maybe born, but spent a quite a bit of time in Iowa. They haven't experienced a healthy river. They have become accustomed to what our rivers look like in the state. Maybe if you're up near the Decorah area where we have some beautiful trout streams, maybe those kids up there can tell you what a healthy river looks like. But for the rest of us, I'm old enough to remember when the rivers were a little bit different. So this improvising imagination is one of the greatest tools of, of an open society. It's where we can actually solve problems. And we are in a crisis of the imagination right now in our country. Doesn't it feel like sometimes we can't solve any big problems? So how do we change that? So how do we release our imagination? First of all, you got to stop, stand back, and reflect. How many people in this room feel like they could take more time for reflection? Yeah. Well, realistically, you probably can. But should you be? Especially the work you do. It's depressing at times, right? Ask questions. We don't ask enough questions. And then actually want to hear the answers. Be playful. When is the last time anybody told you in your job to be playful? I'm telling you right now, be playful. People will want to work with you more. Have creative collaborations. And I'm not saying go make friends with an artist. Everybody has the capacity for creativity. Seek the unexpected. Don't try to plan it all out. Remember flying by the seat of our pants. Experiment and stay hopeful. And by hopeful, I use Jane Goodall's definition that it means Hope, hopefulness means look with clear eyes at the situation and then act. You need both of them. You need to ask yourself what could possibly go wrong. 
that is the basis of hope. Everything else is optimism, which is not hope. Fly by the seat of our pants once in a while. It will exhilarate you and you'll be better at your jobs. So what we need is more creativity and that's imagination plus focused attention. So I haven't given much attention to focused attention. That is actually our reasoning brain. So we have our imaginative brain. You're probably wondering where reason is because we mostly use our reasoning brains. You need both of them in order to do creativity. Your imagination is actually not going to get creative work done. You still need to ration things out and really sort through and use both sides of your brain or both parts of your brain. So can we imagine a healthy river in Iowa? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Are birds singing? Who's nearby and what's in the water? So how did we use all of this in our non-point source management plan? The most subtle thing about this plan are these images that you see before you. We wanted to make this plan for the citizens of the state of Iowa so that they could see what the vision is, not read about it, see it. And when you look at those pictures, doesn't Iowa look like a fantastic place to be? And it is a fantastic place to be, but maybe not as good as it could be. And so we wanted to create this visual image of what our state could be to inspire people so they could begin to imagine that river that looks pretty clean that she's kayaking on. So I always end all my presentations with the Lorax. Unless someone like you cares a whole lot, nothing is going to get better. It's just not. Thank you. Do we have questions for our team? Hi, we have a question from our Zoom attendees. Sadie Newman was wondering, Jacqueline, did you notice a difference in the reason or type of students who were interested in taking a survey versus giving a recorded interview or testimonial? Um, no, we didn't actually look at that. Um, we were just happy that any students were interested in doing the written survey and that anybody would stop and talk to us uh, because they're pretty busy. But, you know, once they stopped, they had a lot to say. And the one thing I didn't mention is while their, their knowledge in the in-person in interviews, and this is in the longer report, while it had improved since I did some of this work 10 years ago, the area that had changed the greatest, and without exception, I think only one student I talked to out of the 60, they all say climate change is happening. We need to do something. And the government and corporations better get their act together. So that urgency was there, but they also told me they heard about it in all their classes, not just science. So no, we didn't really do that. So sorry. This question, oh. Is it on? Oh, okay. I just can't hear myself. <laughs> so this question is for Liz. Um, I really appreciate uh, the way that you evaluate your programs and the the follow up evaluations of you know asking folks, did you implement um, based off of the information that you received? Do you have any other suggestions for how to like quantify or evaluate? some of those less tangible impacts and communicate those. I know these are things that, you know, a lot of people struggle with is these evaluating these softer things. <laughs> so uh, in the field day toolkit, there is an example. I didn't show it on the slide, but of what our year end evaluation looks like. And we do ask some of those, not only what did you do on your farm, but some of those, um, like what is your reasoning for doing those practices? Um, and so more often than not, the motivation aligns with what a lot of folks have said that their motivation is for primarily soil health, soil erosion reduction, and water quality is a distant third. Um, so we are limited in the fact that we do keep it to one page and the amount of questions we asked last year, we even asked a question about, I know there's a lot of push and interest in developing of apps and technology. Um, and it's, it's a scattershot. So apps are expensive to develop and they're even more expensive to maintain. So at this point, we haven't found them to be a valuable tool that we're, we're seeking to, to do. But as 
the actual overseer of our evaluation. So we, I mean, what you're seeing in this toolkit is after years of playing around with questions and playing around with how to ask it. And then, and actually that follow-up survey, I have to give kudos to Alan Bonini from the Iowa DNR. He's the one who said, well, have you asked them if they've done anything, you know, and he's the one who really pushed us to do that follow-up survey. Um, we keep it simple. That's why we get such a great response rate. And we, our response rate is one mailing. We're not doing any follow-up. We don't track who sends it back. Um, and we do actually collect a lot of information. So if you're curious to see how that works for our program, just go to the Iowa Learning Forms and check out the whole report. Um, and, and don't underestimate your own power of observation to teach you some things to have feedback at those field days. So I know that sounds that we do our staff, my staff does it, but I expect them to be honest if something went wrong or they were hearing something. We also write down all the questions that they get asked at a field day. And I will say we also take the time to hand sign all of the letters. So if we're going to ask them to take the time to send it back, we sign them all. A little, I a little bit dread asking this question, but I am very interested in all the surveys that you guys have done. And um, so I work for EPA and I have to deal with the Paperwork Reduction Act. Um, and there are ways to get through it, but it can be a long, long process. And so I'm wondering if your programs have figured out a way to make that process easier. And if there's a template out there that you guys are willing to share. We do. You answer that. You created the template for reporting that makes it so much easier. Yeah. So uh, we have our event evaluation. We do this for all of our events. So even today, on our way home, and down your Anna's writing down our questions. So we will complete an event evaluation for this because we turn it into our funders because they're helping pay for us to be here as well. Um, and so it's just something we do now. Um, we bring on uh, five to seven interns in the summer and we expect them to participate in this process as well. Um, and so in terms of like internal evaluation, are you thinking more like mailed survey evaluation? Sorry. So there's um, an internal paperwork process for okay. EPA funding that we have to go through. Yes, and so do we, because we're getting funding from you through the Iowa DNR. So we started seven years ago doing what we call project lead reports. So every one of the grants we have, we have the deliverables. And then as we gather this information for every month, we fill in those deliverables and track it. So then when I have to write a report for Steve and Steve, it actually doesn't take that much time. And so we, yes, with we, any given moment, we have like seven to eight different grants going. And so, yeah, we're systematic in our data collection and it saves us time. We are not, I mean, as, as Steve Conrad would tell you, we have pretty thorough reports too, maybe more information than he'd like, but that's also why we are still funded after, you know, at 20 years, next year's 20 years, because I can show them through good evaluation that we are being successful, that we're having an impact. At one point before the pandemic shut me down, shut field days down, we were actually predictive of the number of cover crops in the state based on our evaluation from the field days. And we were pretty darn accurate. Add anything on your data collection? Um, well, um, it's kind of ongoing. We we try different tools, different things. Uh, a lot of our data goes into the grits, the EPA's reporting tool. So uh, the project information, the loads, the best managed practices are all there. Um, I at one point in time I wanted to create sort of a database in house, but it seems to be redundant. So, you know, it's extra work. And, and so we use existing platforms primarily. Um, Katie Flay from EPA. I had the pleasure to support Tim on this um, from the contract side of the house. And we at EPA, so we funded a contractor who worked with Tim that you heard, um, and we were hypersensitive to that. So we didn't, e the EPA money that supported Tim's work did nothing 
with the survey itself, um, sending it out, anything like that. That was all on his team's responsibility and, and the funding for driving the um, postcards or the date, the, the things to the post office came from that team. Yeah. Well, and the bulk of our funding, the bulk of our funding is actually state funds from the um, Department of Agriculture um, in Iowa. So we actually everything is covered on our grants because we're self funded. So and you're you're that's competitively how we do funded. What's that? You're competitively funded. Competitively, yes. Okay, that, that answers okay. that question. I'm gonna wait a second. We're competitively funded, except they love the Iowa Learning Farmers Program now, and IDOLS, the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. We are such a driver in the state when it comes to field days, water quality work, conservation, that it doesn't, I don't have to work quite as hard because the program after at almost 20 years is speaking for itself. And we also keep it reinventing ourselves because we don't want to bore anyone. Thanks very much. I think Katie got to the point that I was trying to make, which is like, how are you guys dealing with the PRA part of it that EPA has to go through? And it sounds like because of the competitive funding and because you're not actually using EPA funding for that, that you guys don't have to do that. So that's great. Yeah, we don't use federal funds for money or for food. So, yeah. Liz, I'm just, is it working? Yeah. I'm just wondering if you put people for your field days in the stream as well as at the practices? We have not taken people physically into a stream um, outside of inviting our farmer partners specifically to an event uh, that we held in Ames. Typically, um, that's another thing that's covered in the, the, the book a little bit more detail is as we think about Iowa farmers, our demographic is going to be, you know, 50 to 60 plus with varying mobility um, so if we think about a field component, how far are we asking people to walk? What kind of terrain are we asking them to walk on? That kind of goes into your equipment needs. If you need a people mover, do you need a, at least to have a side-by-side -side that's going to be able to, to transport people? And also not to keep people captive. So if you're going to put them on a hay rack and drive them around a farm, you have to stick to your agenda. Do not hold people captive. Okay, so my question's mainly for Liz and Jacqueline. Uh, fantastic presentations. Um, I really liked you enhancing engagement through farm days, uh, imagination and storytelling. Uh, I've been really impressed with the largest soil health event in our nation that happens in Iowa in December in about one month, the big soil health event. They bring in people like the Aldo Leopold Conservation Award winners. Uh, they have great storytelling. And I was wondering how much do you guys engage with that group of folks who is improving our soil health, turning flooding liabilities into biologically filtered groundwater assets, and protecting our water quality at enhanced agricultural profit? Well, we deal with a lot. We also have, just talking about field days with learning farms, we also have like 90 plus farmer partners across the state. In any given year, we are dealing with hundreds and hundreds of farmers. But I will say I directly nominated the person who won the first Aldo Leopold Award last year, Seth Watkins. A lot of our farmer partners I've known for years, and I call them friends. Um, you know, we're a small state. It's like one big neighborhood in some ways. So aware of all the wonderful things that people are doing. A lot of those farmers are coming to our field days. We've also partnered with Practical Farmers of Iowa a lot during the course of our time. So one thing with our efforts toward field days is we're beginning to realize the necessity to reward and or compensate our producers for that time that they're donating quote unquote to this effort do you all do this at all do you pay a stipend for your producer mentors the ones that are doing your field days do we you feel not. that's important no um so our field day hosts do not get paid um but we also don't lean on them for much of the planning process so i know um some of the collaborators we work with they do pay a stipend because then they 
um, request that the farmer coordinate the catering and do that kind of logistics. So really my ask when I reach out to a farmer partner is, or, or even a farmer I don't necessarily even know, they don't necessarily need to be a farmer partner, um, is if they're willing to open up their farm for a couple hours and tell their story, I will take care of everything else. And I have not had anyone tell me no. So whether I'm just lucky on that front, um, but we do not give a stipend to our field day hosts. Often if there's leftover food, they are the beneficiaries, um, but it's not like they get a check from the university uh, for hosting the event. And most of them don't ask for anything or want anything. Um, what we have done is sometimes reimburse mileage for some of our speakers um, that may be traveling a good distance to come, but we don't compensate the, the farmer hosts or the farmer speakers. Most turn it down. All right, do we have any other questions? Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, just thank you again to all of you on the panel. Um, my name is Lee. I'm here with uh, Crew, which is a, a climate and community resilience group in the greater Boston area. And um, I guess I had a comment and then a question. So first, I just want to say, um, like Jack and I have so much gratitude for what you presented here, because this to me is an antidote to what just occurred in the session before this, where I felt distress when I heard your colleagues say that about the language and just change in the language and the move below well, to the back, which I'm, I connect with journalism and moving below the fold intentionally so that we're not speaking truth to what is real um, and what you just mentioned that directly university students are naming over and over again. So, um, so I just wanna name, I kind of have, it's like two things happening within me right now. Relief, <laughs> given what you've named here and distress. And I wanna lift up the distress thing too, because even when we first got here on Monday, I said to my coworker, you know, are, are we gonna talk at all about the moment we're in now and the moment we will potentially be in a year from now, two years from now, and uh, not even just like, would we have jobs, but like the presentation you just gave today, like what will be the parameters within we're working and I heard massaging and softening language and, you know, I'm thinking censoring, you know, so this is like kind of what my brain is doing. And I just wanna name that in case others in this room are feeling similarly. Um, and I also just, cause I, I also wanna just say, even though your colleagues aren't sitting next to you now, I, I thank you for feeling, for trusting, I think this space enough to be able to like name, here's what we're experiencing and here's what we did in this moment to still be able to move forward in the way that we feel satisfied right now, but that's now. So I think just, so just wanna name those things. And it's not necessarily that we are having that conversation here that we've carved out space within this conference um, to navigate that and looking forward um, so that and then I did have a question specifically about the surveys and this would apply mostly to yours I think but maybe anyone could talk about you, you mentioned place um, and so in addition to asking students to respond to water quality and like the perception um, I think often about visioning sessions I'm in and when we're talking with people about like how to do that visioning, um, it sometimes requires asking people to give an example in their lives or of a place that they think matches what we wanna live into, if that makes sense. So like, I wonder in, in your surveys, like how much there's sort of inquiry around, um, where have you experienced a healthy river? Where, where, where have you connected with that? Or where have you seen a model of that? Um, yeah. yeah, so I'll, I'll do you wanna, Okay, so I think I was hearing a couple of things that you were asking. One, um, my realization that after I got done doing the campus interviews, we did ask them if they recreated on water, like the experience, and unfortunately, a lot of them did not. You know, and these were all you know native Iowans, and they, the ones that we stopped and interviewed, and they did not. But I still think um, I could have done, asked different questions, like, and just had gotten different responses from them to try to really engage on this issue. But I will say this, I think on the water quality issue, on the water issue, 
but can I, I think every time we say quality, we become, it's again, a re resource to manage. It's not a living, breathing thing. Like, okay, I know we got a bunch of soil health fans in the room. Why aren't we saying water health? Why does soil get to have a biological process, but water is still a commodity that farmers get to ignore and we've got to manage? It's also a living thing. There are organisms living in that water that are important. So maybe we need to change our language. And that's why I said, what would a healthy river look like? Who's living around it? Who's drinking the water? I mean, we're lucky as humans, we get to filter it, right? So... Um, I, yes, I could have done a better job of asking questions. And I feel like, so I'm lucky. I am toward the end of my career. And I am getting, some people say I was always outspoken and bold, but I'm getting more outspoken and bold. I do worry about my staff, so I don't want to say anything that's going to cause threat their funding. You're welcome. <laughs> but I think I'm in a position to, we have got to start talking about things a little bit differently. We have got, and so after I leave here, we're going to start heading back to Iowa, and then we have to stop because I'm giving a talk to the Soil and Water Conservation Society's Emerging Leadership Program. And I will be giving them some of the same messaging about, and I share them a story, so I'm going to share it with you. Jane Goodall is my heroine. I love that woman. She got me into anthropology. I don't know her personally, but I've, I've read what she's written, and I just happened to watch a documentary with her in it that they, I think it was made a couple of years ago when she was 80, 88, maybe 89, 88. And she speaks in that documentary about how she really wants to stop doing this work. And so sometimes, and she's a very, uh, she's actually a very spiritual slash religious person. And so she will pray, can I just stay home at my beautiful house in England or go down to Gambi and hang out with my ch beautiful chimpanzees in my beautiful house in Tanzania? And then she'll get an answer that makes her pack her bag and get back on a flight. 88 years old. And she does it because she knows she can. And she tells, the, and she talks to primarily young people. And she tells them that no one was ever convinced of anything through anger. So if you're feeling angry at times, you got to figure out a way to overcome it. Good leadership says, and, and anger actually is a very powerful tool, but use it right. But it's okay to get discouraged and to feel that anxiety and then take a deep breath. Picture Jane Goodall at 88. Now she's almost 90 and she's still doing it and she's making a heck of a difference. And those young people through her roots and she, she was the first person to say environmentally, got to talk to those kids because they're going to be making those decisions soon. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we have to, yes, it can be hard. And doing this stinks sometimes. And that's okay. Yeah. Did you want to add any final comments? Questions are hard. <laughs> um, and we often don't, don't ask the right questions. And primarily because a lot of people in these positions have a technical slash scientific background. And we're not marketers. We're not... We don't have the imagination we need to. We don't have that kind of training or so we don't go there. So if you're putting together a survey um, or you want to find out what people think of what's going on, you need to pick the right partners to do it, to help you. Uh, you need to find the communicators, the marketers, the people with imagination, um, because if it's not you, then it's not going to work. I'll just add on too, as we found, I think what strengthens this water survey report is that we didn't just do the survey. You're only going to get so much information from a written survey. What really strengthened the report was all these campus interviews and then going out and doing listening sessions where we could add context from real quotes from people that have participated to this responses on their survey. All right, I want to thank the audience for great questions. Um, and I definitely let's give our speakers a round of applause for some really great information. Hopefully they'll be around for a little bit longer if you have any follow-up questions. But right now we're headed to lunch. We'll be we're gonna be meeting with our regional groups. And so hopefully you've already arranged for that 
know where you're going to meet them, and we'll be back at 1245, or no, 145, sorry. Come grab a field day toolkit. Yes, we don't want to carry them home. <laughs> oh, absolutely.